Yes, hello, welcome to LML Theory Iceberg Day stream. Yes, this is going to be a humdinger, as they say. Hello, friends. Going to be doing the stream a little bit differently. Uh, I'll be on the side here. Hello, hi. I'll be tiny and on the side, and I've got uh, Adobe Photoshop running to show you my Theory Iceberg. Of course, I am ripping off the great... Uh, the great um, Alt Shift X or Alt Swift X, who of course did a seven hour theory iceberg stream. And he basically was covering all the, uh, all the major Song of Ice and Fire theories. Um, he did it in two parts and then eventually combined it in one podcast or one video. Strongly recommend watching that video as well as all of Alt Shift X videos. Uh, Alt Shift X, of course. You guys all know about him, you know, legendary YouTuber, kind of setting some standards out there. Him and Quinn's ideas really are two of the people that I look to the most as far as standard setting in the YouTube game. Um, there's lots of people, obviously, but those are people I watch. Uh, Alt Shift also, by the way, just while I'm shouting him out, he recently did a Tyrion video. The true character of Tyrion uh, was an hour-long produced video. One of the best of Song of Ice and Fire videos I've ever seen. It's very good. Um it's kind of like what would happen if I took all of my Danny reread podcasts and condensed it down into like an hour of here's the real character of Danny versus the show person. He did that for Tyrion uh, and is exceptional. So I definitely recommend that. Um, all shift X, you guys should know, of course. But what I'm doing here is I'm borrowing the uh, borrowing the model. And uh, he did give me his blessing, by the way. Um, and then we're, we're doing today, what we're doing today is LML theories. Um, so this is either going to be theories that are mine, theories that uh, a friend of mine has come up with, like Ravenous Readers, her Under the Sea theory is in here, a couple from Duran Durandon. Um, and there's also a couple of fandom theories that have been around longer than me for which I have provided evidence for. So these are all theories that are either my theories or theories that I've talked about in my videos, essentially. So this is the LML Theory Iceberg. If, you've, if you're new to the channel, this would be a great video to watch. We're going to start with the simplest theories and go down to the most complex and crazy. Uh, yeah, I'll give Alt, Shift, uh, Alt Swift a shout out for his eight-minute Tywin rap. Yes, he did do an eight-minute Tywin rap. Um, and now my minute-and-a-half nimble dick flow feels pitiful and insignificant. Um, but perhaps I will... I will expand the nimble dick flow and uh, see what I can get going, maybe. But yeah, it was really good. You know, it started off, the Tywin rap starts off, you're like, oh gosh, another corny. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, that was a good rhyme. And then it, it gets going, Alt Swift. Yeah, you can you can break it down. Thanks, Carl Karsnark, dropping the link in here. Um, Carl, also, I was wondering if, uh, if I could task you, since you're so attentive, um, or if another mod wants to volunteer for this, can you just jot down the times at which I start each new theory so that I can go back and easily index this? Um, just jot down the times and a couple words, the title of the theory, that'd be awesome. Um, if you guys could talk amongst yourselves and figure out who's going to do that, mods, um, I don't know if who's got the most, uh, who will be the easiest to do that, but that'd be sweet. Minty is uh, going to be in and out today, so I can't ask it of her. That being said, here's how this is going to go. Um, I'm going to, we're going to go row by row. And the first the first two levels are above the water. Uh, the water line is going to be Moon Meteor's theory. If you, uh, if you know, um, it's, that's basically, I mean, obviously that's what I'm famous for. That's what people know me for. Uh, so that, that is the water line. Everything above the water line is stuff that is simpler than Moon Meteor's theory. And everything below will be headier, if you will. All right. So first first level, if you will. And you guys, as I go here, um, feel free to have input. Um, some of the feedback I'm looking for is uh, theories I may have forgotten. So if it seems like there's something I didn't mention uh, and we're getting you know past the level where it should be, or if you guys think that a theory should be further up or down, 
feel free. Also, as I announce each theory, I'm going to ask you guys to give me percentages of what percentage you, chance you think something has of coming true. And best of all, I've got pictures for every theory, guys. Pictures for every theory. So, for example, Dawn is Lightbringer. It's the simplest theory. This is one where, like, you have to know this. This is instinctual. As soon as you start hearing about Dawn, the sword of the morning, it's pretty obvious. It's the one special sword in the story. Now, we've got variations on, you know, Dawn and Lightbringer and all that stuff. Uh, so here, for example, is, oh, I can actually zoom back out. This is a bigger one. This is Arthur Dane. So Arthur Dane by Mobo Bohm. And I have modified it, as you can see, to make it look like Dawn is Lightbringer. So this is our Dawn is Lightbringer picture. So like I said, it's pretty basic. It's one of those things. It's probably light. I mean, how is it not Lightbringer? Like, what the hell is it if it's not Lightbringer, right? <laughs> so pretty basic stuff. That one's not mine. That was obviously that's around in the fandom before I came along. Uh, next one, Valerians are actually lizard people. Oh, uh, this one is going to be Rego Targaryen by Morgane Le Fay. And as soon as Danny has her baby Rego, we don't see it, but Jora and Miriam Mazder both see it. So we know that it actually was a lizard baby. And then in the world of Ice and Fire, we hear about more lizard babies from a few other. Uh, Rhaenyra has one. Magor has one. Might be one other, I think. And so, clearly, whatever the blood of the dragon is, it's a human-animal hybrid. The Valerians are lizard people, 100%, right? They have to, clearly, they have some amount of reptilian DNA to be able to pop out lizard babies like little Rego here. So that's that's a pretty basic one, right? That's easy. Now, how about this one? The others made the wall. This is a slightly more complex, but again, it's just sort of a basic thing. It's a it's a giant wall made of ice and made with magic, and we've met ice demons already. So when we get <laughs> When we when we we meet the others in the prologue, and then when we meet the wall, and they're talking like, "Oh yeah, super old, a little bit of mystery behind it." You have to think maybe the others made the wall. I don't know if they did, but it's a pretty basic idea, and certainly not my idea. That one's been around for a hot second. Um, yes, and I've got oh I've got sorry I've got an image for that too. This is building the wall by Chase Stone. Also, I forgot, I meant to start the stream with uh, with my stag crown. I got a little new cosplay here for you guys. Just real quickly, I'll break from the screen. So, uh, yes, um, it's about time they got a fitting crown in it, the Halloween store. And so I capitalized on it and snatched it up with all speed. Yes, yes, I know my beard's a bit short, but I'm sure you recognize King Robert Baratheon, especially with my crown, my stag crown, yes. <laughs> Blarty, blarty, blar. All right. That's, that's, uh, it's for the Bobby B fans out there. So the wall, did giants build it? I mean, just look at the picture. This picture does not look, it just doesn't look like a thing that happened to me. There's Bran the Builder and a Child of the Forest in the bottom right corner. And there's the giants carrying cubes of ice and stacking them up. I just don't think this is how the wall was built. It, it has, to, I think it's got to be more magical, which means either the others or potentially somebody who could wield ice magic who wasn't an other. Gods, I was strong then. Yes. So there we go. Building the wall. Maybe it was the others. So the White Walkers are of the wood. They're literally called the White Walkers of the wood. But what I'm referring to here, of course, is the idea that they are from the Weirwood in some sense. To me, this is a very obvious one. And I'm, I'm talking about a baseline idea here, not a developed theory. We'll talk about the idea that they're an exiled hive mind or whatever a little bit later. 
the basic notion here is that the White Walkers have some connection to the Weirwoods. The, the reason why I think this is an obvious level of theory is because Waymar walks in the prologue and these they're penetrating the woods. The entire prologue before they meet the others, the trees are clutching at Waymar. The woods are giving him creeps. The other two rangers are like, I don't know, maybe we should turn back. And he's like, no, we shall go forward. And then the others come out. The others reflect the trees. They look like the trees. A shadow emerged from the dark of the wood. That sentence always reads to me like, the others are the id of the wood, like the dark of the wood. The wood's repressed shadow self. That's what the others are, the shadow self of the weirwoods. And of course, the first um, Song of Ice and Fire analysis video that I ever watched that made a huge influence on me was Quinn's Ideas, then called Ideas of Ice and Fire, of course. Um, the True Origin of the White Walkers, I believe, is the title. It's the one where he talks about the she and all that. Oh, I forgot the picture. There you go. Let me zoom back out. This is one of the best White Walker pictures. This is uh, Lee Moyer, The Others. This is obviously the Waymar prologue. You can see the broken sword, the eye wound. But what this one really gets is the, the mirror armor. It looks like liquid, like a like water, like, like pond water, reflections on the surface of water. And it's um it reflects the green of the trees, the white of the snow, and the black of the darkness. So this really, this is what the others would have looked like. Almost almost like tree camouflage potentially somewhat insubstantial so that is that's this idea that is the white walkers are of the wood and this is 100 percent going to be the case in some sense it's just a matter of in what sense are they from the wood but as soon as you read the story in my opinion you should start thinking about that <clears throat> like i feel like we in the fandom We've gone so deep in all these theories, so we're thinking about the technicals, the technicalities of the theories, and how, how exactly are they created. But just as a baseline principle, the White Walkers being of the wood is just, it's pretty obvious. Don't overthink it. And then lastly, Dawn is the last hero's dragon steel. This is slightly less obvious than the idea that Dawn is Lightbringer. You have to get into the story of the last hero and think about, okay, his sword broke, and then the tail cuts off, and later we hear about the last hero slaying the others with dragon steel. So Bran gets the last hero story in book one, and... John and, and Sam are talking about dragon steel. I think it's either in book three or book five. So they're very separated and you have to sort of start thinking about, okay, well, Dawn is made from a meteor and meteors can be dragons. So dragon steel could be meteor steel and dragon steel sounds like Valerian steel, but Valeria wasn't around and Dawn is supposed to be that old. So it's slightly more, cryptic than dawn is lightbringer but it's still pretty friggin' obvious like what could have been like the last hero had this amazing sword it was dragon steel and the others couldn't stand against it what could that be it's obviously something to do with lightbringer dawn whatever whatever so this is zippo 514 the artist here uh hey welcome to squishers sums So I, I did modify this one. Originally, there this was not Dawn. It was just a regular looking sword in this guy who kind of looks like John. I think this is meant to be the fist of the first men. It looks like because of the little fence there. Um, but it's hard to tell. Actually, it looks like the White Walkers are kind of walking into the distance. They're actually not on a hilltop. It's just called like the Night's Watch versus the Others, I believe is the title. So it's, um yeah, the Night's Watch versus the Others. So I guess it's just a generic Night's Watch fight. I'm not sure if it's meant to be John or not. It looks kind of like John, but I've essentially been using this as my last hero art because there's precious little last hero art in the world. And so I've been using this one as my last hero picture for a while. 
I went in there and photoshopped it uh, to make it white and glowing so that it looks like Dawn in the hands of the last hero because that's something I need to talk about quite a bit. There we go. Thank you, Zippo514. Hope you don't mind me adding Dawn to your artwork. So that's the first level. We're, we're way above the surface. This is simple stuff here. Definitely not as complex as Moon Meteors, right? So let's let's go level two. All right. So you can see we got a, some fresh theories here. Knights, Queen, and King were making others. So this is something you have to put together. And let me just zoom out here. Get it. There we go. So on the right, let me give you the artist first. On the right, we have Knights, King, and Queen by Undead Lemming. And on the left is Knights, King, and His Queen by Cortana. So once we hear about Craster sacrificing to the others, and it's basically spelled out in that chapter, they're, they're, they're giving Craster's male sons to the others, and, and the Craster's wives refer to the others as Craster's sons and the baby monster's brother. So we know that sacrificing to the others means giving them babies, and it's implied that the babies are turned into others somehow. With a little help from White Walker Daycare. So now then you go back to, and this is all in the same book, by the way. Um, we get the Craster reveal over the course of book two and three. And then later in book three, Bran goes to the Night Fort. And we hear the Night's King story. And we hear that he was, you know, he was caught when it was, he was caught, you know, sacrificing to the others. And Night's Queen is in some sort of other female other or something like that. So pretty basic to figure out that Knights, King, and Queen were making others at the Night Fort. We're not going to get into the timeline heresy of when I think they did that or if they were first or anything, but just the, the figuring out that Craster and Gilly are parallel and that Knights, King, and Queen were making others. This is basically canon in my mind. This is pretty simple stuff. Starks have the blood of the other. Okay. So this is, again, another one of those where there's a more complex version of this theory. But just as a baseline, when you look at the Starks, there's a lot of clues that they're tied to the others. Obviously, we're told that Night's King was a Stark. They live in this place called Winterfell. The story is called A Song of Ice and Fire. And obviously, the dragons and the Targaryens are fire. So the Starks and the others represent ice, it would seem, right? And then, like I said, there's <clears throat> a great connection. In the prologue, uh, one Night's Watchman, Waymar, is killed by ice swords of the others. And then the next chapter opens up with Ned Stark executing his fellow Night's Watch Ranger, Garrod, with a sword called Ice. So we're encouraged to see Ned and the others in the same role right from the start. John's name is Jon Snow. Lyanna has a crown of blue winter roses. And let me give you some artwork here, by the way. I'll zoom out on this one. So we can see this. The one on the left is uh, Crypts of Winterfell by Yoon Yang. And the one on the right is Winter is Coming by Dame de Broom. So you can see Lyanna in a snowy god's wood. It's ice on the weirwood tree. And this, of course, is some sort of idea about Jon Snow being resurrected in the crypts. Blue other eyes. Could be a reference to Rob as well. But you get the idea. It's just not going to go into... This is not like a technical version of this theory. It's just you're reading the book. You're sensing that the Starks are connected to the others. Perhaps the Starks have the blood of the others, just as the Targaryens have the blood of the dragon. And of course, I've made a more detailed version of this theory involving stolen baby from the others and stuff like that. The idea that Sam and Gilly rescuing monster from being turned into an other is some sort of historical echo 
of something that happened back in the past. Knights, King, and Queen. So as soon as you think about Knights, King, and Queen making others, it's a pretty intuitive leap to think, well, one of those babies might have been taken home by the Stark who threw him down. And a great parallel for that, of course, is Ned taking home Jon Snow after she after he was born to Lyanna of the Blue Winter Roses <clears throat> and raising him as a Stark. So that's the blood of the other theory. And by the way, if you you see there's a little bit of a left-right axis to the where I've put these theories. The ones on the right are going to be my theories. And the ones on the left are going to be ones that do not belong to me. So, for example, on the top row, those are also general. None of them are really mine. Um, but if we get to the second row here, so the next one we have is cold hands, is an undead skin changer. This is my theory. I've never heard anyone suggest this before I did, and not many people are onto this either. Um, most people, a lot of people surprisingly think he's a meat puppet of cold hands. I mean, of blood raven, which I think is terrible because cold hands seems like he has a lot of individuality and personality to me. And the main thing is that Jon Snow is a skin changer and he's just died. So he's about to become a resurrected skin changer Night's Watchman. So it's pretty obvious to look at cold hands and think maybe that's what happened. I mean, he rides the uh, he rides an elk, which is something that the green men are said to do. And that's as soon as Bran hears that he rides an elk. He asks Sam, oh, was he green? Was he a green man? Because that's who ride elks. And then Cold Hands, of course, talks to the ravens and uses. Um, uh, let's see, and, and uses the ravens to spy and do his dirty work and stuff like that. So Cold Hands is an undead skin changer. I thought of that one independently. I wouldn't be surprised if other people think that, too. It's not that really cryptic, but uh, I will claim originality. Uh, Alt Shift uh, has mentioned it. Cool. Yeah. Figures. Smart guy. So this art uh, on the left, Cold Hands by Diego Gisbert Lorenz. And on the right, that is Blue Ultramare. There's a lot of great Cold Hands art. It was honestly hard to choose just two. But there you go. So the next one, Dawn is the original ice of House Stark. Um, I This is one where I thought of it originally. Um, and then I found other people who had thought of it also. So I will claim originality in that I thought of it on my own. But I probably wasn't the first to say this. <clears throat> in particular, this one guy from the westeros.org forums who uh, who came to this idea before me. Um, but he's a real jerk, and I'm not going to say his name because he's just been rude to me too many times. So screw you, buddy. <clears throat> if you're watching, you know who you are. <clears throat> he's not watching, though. He hates me. So in any case, Dawn is the original Ice of House Stark. It's a very simple theory, actually. Was the last hero a Stark? Probably, right? It's the most likely answer. The Starks are kind of the home team. The last hero story is given to Bran. John and Bran both seem to have parallels to the last hero. The last hero had a dog, probably a wolf, right? So the, if the last hero was a Stark, then that means a Stark wielded the sword of dragon steel, whatever that was. And the most likely sword to be dragon steel is Dawn. And what does Dawn look like? A big ice sword. I mean, it's white and it glows. And if you've ever seen milk glass, milk glass is like shiny white. It's mostly opaque, but it's got a little bit of pearlescence. And it definitely catches the light and plays with the light in a nice shimmery kind of way. So a sword that looks like milk glass, it really would look like shiny white ice. So yeah, how Stark may have existed or it may have been formed right after the long night. But the point is, whoever was the last hero was in the bloodline of what we consider to be Stark. Most likely. I think there's some I think there's some Stark Dane fuckery there, but the Danes descend from the great empire of the dawn. And I think the last hero has a connection to both 
the Great Empire of the Dawn and the, what became the bloodline of House Stark. But the point is, as soon as you hear about the last hero, most likely answers that he was a Stark. And the last hero's dragon steel was probably Dawn. And that means that a Stark probably wielded Dawn against the others. And so they've got this naming tradition that goes back to the Age of Heroes of naming their swords ice. Let me pull up some pictures. So as you can see, these are pictures of Dawn. Just look at it, you know. <laughs> look at the guy on the right. That's supposed to be Arthur, but just imagine him looking at the sword like, hmm, what should I call it? Well, it was, it's was. it been called Dawn since it won the war for the Dawn and defeated the Long Night. They've been calling it Dawn since then. But the thing looks like a stick of ice. And so when we have the Starks calling their family sword ice since the Age of Heroes, there's really only two possibilities of that tradition. One, they're naming their sword after the swords of the others, which would imply that a Stark wielded a literal ice sword of the others. And that's possible because maybe this, you know, maybe there was a that first Stark who was stolen from the others. Maybe he was kind of an ice wizard and maybe he wielded an other sword against the others. Who knows? But it's more likely to me that this goes back to the last hero wielding Dawn. Now we're going to get into the Great Empire of the Dawn theory, of course. Um, it's very likely that the sword Dawn is from the East, from the Great Empire of the Dawn, just like the Danes. We'll explain that in a minute. So what the scenario that emerges is the Danes bring the sword to Westeros, maybe even Azor Ahai himself. Um, and at some point it's used by a Stark to win the war for the Dawn, but then it's essentially returned to House Dane because that's whose sword it is. And there's a little bit of an echo at this at the Tower of Joy, where Ned and his gray wraiths take on the King's Guard in white, symbolizing the others. And we have this War for the Dawn type fight. And then Ned returns Dawn to Starfall afterward. So perhaps that's an echo of the last hero returning Dawn to Starfall after he used it. <clears throat> One second, I must silence my bird. That should do it, he says confidently. Yeah, so um, on the right is Sir Arthur Dane by Mobo Canario, and on the left is Sir Arthur Dane by Henning Ludwigsen. Um, so yes, the other clues about this are that there are four times in the story when a sword is raised up and catches the glint of the sunlight, and the phrase runs with morning light is used. Twice it is used when John wields Longclaw, because ultimately I believe that John it is John who will wield Dawn and will echo the, a Stark last hero wielding Dawn. Um, and by the way, this, this uh, iceberg stream here is for ancient lore theories. We're going to do an entire another one to cover predictions for the main story. So this is all ancient lore theories today, and we will do predictions uh, maybe next week. But the point is, John's sword runs with morning light twice, which seems like a foreshadowing for him wielding dawn, and that makes sense because it originally was used by a Stark. Then the other two times, it was uh, Rob when he's holding a regular sword but demanding that the Lannisters return ice. It's that first scene where he appears as a king of winter, um, and he uh, essentially has got his sword across his lap. And he's got his direwolf at his side. So he's imitating the King of Winter statue, and he's demanding the return of ice, and his sword runs with morning light. So it seems pretty uh, heavy symbolism, to say, if you could say that. So that's Dawn is the original ice. Of course, I've got two videos about that. You can watch for the full story. And lastly, the last above the waterline theory, the squishers are real. 
Hmm, let's see what happens when I click this bit. Uh, oh my god! <laughs> this is a collection of squisher art. I'll pull the names up for you in a second. I just want to give you a minute to look gaze upon this. The deep one on the right is Teos Ulanti. Um, let's see here. The Neonomicon, which is the one of them coming out of the water. That one is by Jason Burroughs. And the sexy squisher, <laughs> the real, the ripped one. That one is Deep One Rising by Paha Pasi. Paha Pasi. And the Cthulhu is let's see who did the cthulhu there old squid face that's the great old ones by tentacles and teeth so this theory is simply that squishers exist fish people exist uh they have to there's too many there's too much there's too many fish people lurking around for the squishers not to be real and here's the serious picture this is from the isle of toads and this is by Martin H. Mathis from the Unseen Westeros Project. And here you can see is an oily black stone toad idol. It's a little more greenish in this color. It's supposed to be 40 feet tall. And you can see the person in the lower left has sort of a weird face because the people of the Isle of Toads are said to have a fish-like aspect. And then, of course, on the Three Sisters, they have the mark, which is webbed, webbed hands or feet. And then there's just legends of squishers everywhere. There's fish people on the Thousand Islands. Squishers love Thousand Island dressing. This is known. Oh, sorry. I meant to quit slurping my tea into the microphone. Sorry, guys. I will put a, I'll put a stop to that. So there we go. Uh, the squishers are real. It's just kind of obvious. So I don't think they're going to be. Yeah, squishers, merlings, deep ones, all the same. All I'm saying is aquatic humanoids. I don't think they're going to play a major role in the story. However, they are real. They are. They do exist. And shout out to all of my members who have clicked the join button to pay $5 a month to get a cool squisher icon next to their name. You'll see them in the chat. Gabe the Griffin, Swagger Dagger, Grey Waste, Tim. And uh, yeah, so the squisher, uh, squisher people can use special emojis too. All right, so let's go below the surface, guys. As you can see, patch face is lurking down here. As we get deeper into the deeper into the water, we will uh we will go we will go further into madness. We'll start hearing the whisperings that patch face hears. So level three, here we go. Here's our new theories. Take a look. I'll zoom in a little. So Azor Ahai is the Night's King. This one, I've got, again, a more developed theory about it, but it's pretty basic, really. Um, the hero is the villain, okay? That's the, that's the general idea. We hear this legend about Azor Ahai, but gosh, he sounds a little, <laughs> a little bit like a, uh, an antihero, you know, kills his wife, breaks the moon, all that stuff. Um, then we hear about Night King, and he's almost comically villainous to the point where you have to wonder, was there some hidden truth? Is there Was he sacrificing to the others to keep up a pact and placate the others instead of, you know, just to do evil? Something like that. So a lot of people have come to this idea. I have my own version of it, and I think there's I've found a lot of evidence for it that other people have not. However, this was around long before me. Um, Gray Area, in particular, has a developed theory about Azor Ahai being the Night's King. Um, and she also has a lot of correlations to Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn by Tad Williams. Well, there's a character named Inaluki, who sounds like both Azor Ahai and the Night's King. And George has cited this as a big influence on him. So Azor Ahai, Night's King, that theory is out there. Uh, although, like I said, I've provided my own evidence such as 
Okay, looks like Cleo was completely done with the nap. One second. Okay, the bird is here. Everything is calm now. So as you can see from this picture, I know how to use Photoshop. <laughs> so this is Azor High by Ace Official Art on the left. I have turned his eyes blue. And on the right is Stannis by Jack Kaiser. So Stannis is the big clue. Um, Danny sees a vision of Stannis in a dream where he is, it says, a, a blue-eyed, um, it's like, what was it? A man without a shadow. Oh, let me pull up the quote. Jesus. It's like a man with no shadow, raised a red sword. This is during her House of the Undying sequence. Mother of dragons, daughter of death, glowing like sunset, a red sword was raised in the hand of a blue-eyed king who cast no shadow. That is very obviously a reference to Stannis. But the interesting thing is that it combines two very recognizable symbols. Somebody with blue eyes. That's the others. Red sword, that's Azor High. And then all Stannis' symbolism does that. It combines Azor High and Night's King. He takes up residence at the Night Fort. Um, his wife, Selyse, is cold like a corpse, um, like, like the Night's Queen. And she's the one who's anxious to get to Night Fort. Um, Stannis is constantly described as being shadowed and hollow looking. It's blue, his eyes are like a midnight sea, blue black, um, deeply shadowed. Everything is shadow. I think it's used three times in the opening paragraph describing him. <clears throat> and then, of course, his making shadow babies with Melisandre gives his seed and soul to Melisandre. She makes these black shadow entities. Well, this is a parallel to Knight's King and Queen. Knight's King gave his seed and soul to Knight's Queen. And they made the white shadows known as the others. So Stannis is the first place where I got on to this idea that Azor High is the Night's King. There's a lot more evidence than that. So check out the video, Night's King Azor High. Or Azor High the Night's King. I forget which one it is. Next up, Great Empire of the Dawn. This is my vision of Great Empire of the Dawn before the Great Downfall. Of course, the Great Empire of the Dawn, you know, it's Dragon Lords of Ancient Ashai. That's that's the best way to say it. And that's why I called this video Dragon Lords of Ancient Ashai. The idea has been out there a long time that dragons originally came from Ashai and that maybe the Ancient Ashai tamed dragons before the Valerians did or taught the Valerians how to do it. Uh, Septon Barth suggests this in the world of ice and fire and right from the beginning, right from a game of Thrones, Daenerys is hearing about dragons in a shy. <clears throat> it's actually really surprisingly heavy. If when you go back and look at it, it's all over the place. So the idea that dragons come from a shy brand sees them, um, stirring beneath the sunrise as well. But guys, there's a lot of evidence for this. Uh, how Stain is a part of this. You know, how Stain having Valerian looks that are mysterious. No, no connection to House Targaryen. And they're not said to be from Valeria, yet they have, you know, silver hair popping up and purple eyes of various shades or bluish purple eyes. And so it's, you know, how does this happen? Well, even before we got the world of ice and fire and heard about the great empire of the dawn, 
people were onto the idea that House Dane might share a common ancestor with Valeria. Um, Elio and Linda from Westeros.org that, that run Westeros.org, that was one of their pet theories. And so when we heard about the Great Empire of the Dawn, that was basically just putting a name to something we knew already existed, which was an ancient dragon lord civilization in Ashai. And the main thing I want to say about it real quick is just that if you look at Ashai, it's the largest city in the world by a factor of like four, but it's entirely built out of oily stone, which seems to be toxic. So why would you build a huge city out of toxic stone? It doesn't make sense. And it's vastly depopulated now. It seems to me that the obvious answer is that it, it wasn't always made of oily stone. It used to look something more like this. Something beautiful and glorious like Atlantis or Numenor, which is the obvious comparisons, which are the obvious comparisons. So whatever's going on in a shy is obviously magic. There's a magical shadow over the entire peninsula going up into the Shadowlands. Nothing grows there but ghost grass. Nothing lives there but sorcerers. So obviously there's a transformation that happened. And of course, I'm tying this to the moon meteors. I would say that the main moon meteor strike would have been in a shy. And this toxic moon meteor magic is turning all of the Shadowlands toxic. And actually, I've, I've got it later. Um, yeah, so further down, I have oily stone made by moon meteors. We're kind of talking about that now, I guess. But let me pull up this as well. So in the upper right is a picture of an actual comet. That one is Comet 67P with an unpronounceable name. This is the original greasy black stone. Comets actually get coated in black oil and goo when they fly through space. It's called space gunk. And so comets literally are frozen balls of rock and dirt and ice coated in black oil that's like tar. It's compared to the tar on your barbecue. So the original oily black stone was the comet. So it makes sense that all of this oily stone that we see on the planet is either meteorite material or it's stone that was poisoned by the meteorite. And this is very like um, a color out of space from Lovecraft. In a color out of space, the meteor falls and lands and all, all the plants start mutating um, out from radially out from the site of the crash. So this is kind of like that. The meteor that fell was toxic and the entire Shadowlands has been turned toxic. And so basically all the oily black stone that we find elsewhere, it's either quarried from a shy in the Shadowlands like Yin could be that case. Um, or there's another meteor somewhere that landed in Sothorios that created more oily black stone. And obviously Sothorios is all weird and mutated and stuff. So there you go. That's artist concept of Unamea in the bottom right. Another comet. And on the left is Stygi by Dziga Kaiser. And this is another one from Unseen Westeros. You guys know this artwork. I've used it a ton. You can see the oily stone and the green river leading up to the corpse city of Stigai, which is very elven looking, I have to say. I imagine Stigai a little more run down than that. But super awesome artwork. So there you go. And yes, the technical term is space gunk. That's right, Nefertaria. So I kind of handled two at once there. That's the Great Empire of the Dawn. And also the oily stone is made by the meteors. Um, a lot of things flow from moon meteor theory. And I did kind of skip over moon meteor theory. Um, in case you haven't heard, the moon meteor theory is that the legend of the second moon wandering too close to the sun and cracking, giving birth to dragons, is actually talking about meteors, which are often mythicized as dragons. So that's your origin of the long night. Check out Nightbringer series, part one through five. I'm not going to go through all of that. You guys should know what's up with that, but. 
If you're somehow watching this stream and you don't know about Moon Meteor Theory, the Nightbringer series is the one you want. So, a um, couple of things flow from the Moon Meteor Theory and the Long Night Theory. The idea that the Moon Meteors cause the Long Night. Well, the Hammer of the Waters starts to look very obviously like a moon meteor. So let me just show you, let me just show you the hammer of the waters. Here's what happened, okay? So here we see the arm of Dorne. Imagine this broken arm, not broken, okay? Imagine it connecting. And this sea of Dorne used to be an inland sea. So from the rainwood used to connect to the arm of Dorne and the sea of Dorne was an inland sea. The narrow sea did not connect to the Sunset Sea. It would have stopped right around Shipbreaker Bay and Mir, right on that level, right above Tyrosh. That's as far down. So the Narrow Sea is just an extension of the Shivering Sea at this point. But then something happened, which is this. Pew. Pew. You guys get the idea here. I'll turn it uh, transparent so you can. Uh, oh, I don't have it highlighted. Sorry. One second. There we go. So you can see this is really the only thing capable of breaking the arm of Dorne besides just inexplicable magic. And yes, uh, there is a science fiction book called Lucifer's Hammer. And the hammer is a comet. So it's it's good use of mythology. Um, obviously, it's easy to see why Lucifer, why a comet could be called Lucifer's hammer. But there you go. And you'll also notice that uh, you'll notice that um, there's one of the Stepstone Islands called Bloodstone. See it there, Bloodstone. Um, the Bloodstone Emperor is the guy who caused the Long Night, according to the Eastern legend. And he worshipped a black meteor. And since meteors can be called bleeding stars, his black meteor could be called a bloodstone. So he was probably named after the space rock that he worshipped. So naming an island bloodstone and sticking it in the broken arm of Dorne is kind of like showing us bloodstone emperor did it. It's like a bloodstone emperor did it sign. And then we also get certain characters like Daemon Targaryen and others um, taking Bloodstone as their seat or ruling from the Stepstones, which would be an Azor High connection, but let's not get too far afield. So there you go. The Arm of Dorne is a moon meteor. Um, it's just obvious, like I said, once you think about meteors having hit the Earth, uh, you know, you have this great calamity here, and it's just like, well, what could have done it? Well, probably one of those meteors. And then the cool thing is that if you look here, Storm's End is just north. So the story of Storm's End is kind of like, it's, it has echoes of the Azor High story. Durin, God's grief, steals a woman from the gods. And this causes great wrath of the gods, if you will. And of course, what happens is they send a great storm and that kills everyone at their wedding and crushes Durin's hall. And so... He's protected by El and I, but then he rebuilds several times. And each time the castle's knocked down until he builds this really strong castle. It's obvious Monty Python call out, but. The point is that in that story, there's one giant storm, a storm of storms. It's a, a tsunami and a storm. And then it says ever after the gods were still angry. And so they sent storms up Shipbreaker Bay after that so you've got one great event a storm a tsunami and then after that the weather changes so this is a very obvious mythical recount of real history when the arm of dorn broke it would have sent a tsunami racing up the newly formed narrow sea that would have gone in shipbreaker bay would have hit storm's end and tarth and other places like that so that's where that storm came from that was the breaking of the arm of dorn and then after that, the weather would have changed because the oceans are now connected. 
This very warm sunset sea is mingling with the narrow sea, which is, again, cold because it's really part of the shivering sea. So this is going to change all the ocean currents and thus the weather patterns. And that explains the uh, the storms. <clears throat> so it's a really nice interlocking myth between the hammer of the waters, the idea that there were moon meteors, and Durin God's Grief's legend. Stealing this magical woman from the gods. Azor High marries a magical woman and breaks the moon and he has wields the fire of the gods in the form of Lightbringer, let's say. So it's a it's a little bit loose parallels, but if you consider the um the story of the hammer of the waters itself, the hammer of the waters was supposedly called down with blood magic on the Isle of Faces. Either captive humans or captive children of the forest were fed to the weirwoods. Thousands, maybe, or hundreds. And the thing is that it's actually pretty close to the Azor High legend where a blood magic murder of a significant woman, Nissa Nissa, broke the moon. So on one hand, a blood magic murder breaks the moon, and in the other story, blood magic murder broke the arm of Dorne. But the arm of Dorne seems like it might have been broken by a moon meteor. And so we get these stories, actually two different versions of the same story. It's very possible Azor Ahai killed Nissa Nissa in Westeros on the Isle of Faces. Although we, it's hard to say because the stories travel when people migrate. They bring their legends with them, and then they soon get ascribed to the new land. And Azor Ahai has ties to both Westeros and Ashai. So it's very hard to say where he did what. But I tend to I tend to come down on the side of Westeros because that's where the story is centered. One moment, folks. I'm going to put myself off screen for just a second for no particular reason. No reason at all. No reason at all. Okay, so next theory is the Pact Age of Heroes timeline heresy. Timeline heresy. And as you can see, these theories are all on the right, right next to the iceberg. Oh, we've got a tantrum. Come here, girl. I sensed the tantrum coming before it actually erupted that time. Uh, so Great Empire of the Dawn, just real quick. Great Empire of the Dawn is like 80% my theory. Um, one of the biggest pieces of it actually does come from Durin Durandin, who I'm going to mention a couple times today. He connected Danny's vision of those uh, kingly ghosts with Valerian hair and gemstone eyes to the gemstone emperors of the Great Empire of the Dawn, which is one of the key pillars of the Great Empire of the Dawn theory. So I don't know what percentage you want to put on that, but a major piece of Great Empire of the Dawn comes from Durin Durand, and I've always said that and always given him credit for that. Uh, he is, we are boys. We are friends still on Twitter to this day. So all praise to him. And I'm going to mention him, like I said, a couple of times. He also came up with, uh, we're going to talk about in a minute, Bloodstone Emperor and Amethyst Empress being the same as Azor and Nissa Nissa. He came to that one before I showed up on the forums as well. So right around the same time, right after the World of Ice and Fire came out, essentially everybody got new clues and everybody was working on stuff at the same time. He came to that conclusion before uh, we even talked. So in fact, what happened is when I was writing my first theory, I went on Westeros.org before publishing and looked around to see if anybody had had the same um, ideas about the moon meteors and the Great Empire of the Dawn. And... I messaged a couple of people who had been sniffing up the right tree, if you will, and was like, hey, I saw you wrote this theory and I, I think you're right about that and I have this other idea. And so he's been a collaborator of mine since before I even published my first essay. So all props to Durin Durandin. Um, the Hammer of the Waters Moon Meteor, that's obviously mine. The Pact Age of Heroes Timeline Heresy, that's mine as well. And we're going to talk about that now. Choo -choo -choo with this delightful picture of the pact by Ertak Oltenaz. 
who of course has done many great Song of Ice and Fire artworks. Feast your eyes. There we go. And if you look closely, those green men do have horns. They've all got horns of one kind or another. They're pretty small, but they, they're in the background there. But they do have horns. So basically, when you we are told this entirely fictitious story about the timeline. Uh, not entirely fictitious, but it's got a couple of major bugaboos in it. And of course it does. It's 8,000-year-old folkloric history, right? The major thing that's wrong is that uh, we're told the hammer of the waters fell thousands of years before the long night and that the hammer of the waters was called down to break the arm of Dorn so that the first men couldn't invade Westeros anymore. And the children of the forest did it. They destroyed the earth, even though they worshiped the earth. And they are the people who sing the song of earth. They got so angry that they broke the arm of Dorn, which is completely out of character for them. And we've never heard that they have magic like that, but that's what they did. And then when we meet them, they're like, oh yes, our days are ending and we're just passing quietly into the night. And Bran compares that to humans who would take vengeance. But the children don't. So maybe there's some children of the forest out there with different motivations. But everything we've seen of the children of the forest, they wouldn't destroy the earth to save themselves. That's just not really in their character. And, of course, it doesn't make sense to break the arm of Dorne because thousands and thousands of first men have been crossing into Westeros for centuries. So it's very much a case of closing the barn doors after the horses have escaped. For those of you who know American colloquialisms from the South, uh, yeah. But think about it. If you have horses in the barn and they escape, it doesn't do any good to close the barn doors. They're already gone. You should have closed the doors before they left. That's the point. And there's also boats. Yes, good point. There are boats. Ships exist. So it doesn't make sense. And we're given the story. The maesters tell us it doesn't really make sense. They're like, well, this is the story, but it doesn't really make sense because the first men were already crossing. So why would they do that? Well, they didn't do that. Um, if the arm of Dorne was a moon meteor, then it, that means it happened at the time of the long night. And that means Azor High did it. Now, the Azor High story does tie into the idea of green men and blood sacrifice to Weirwood. So that part of the Hammer of the Waters legend is partly true. But the timing is wrong. We know that. Because if it was a moon meteor, that means it happened at the time of the long night. And that makes sense. That's when all the disasters happened. That's when everyone died and the earth was in a global winter and all that shit. So the other big clue about this is the pact. The pact is very mysterious. The first men suddenly stopped genociding the children of the forest, which they had been doing for centuries and started instead worshiping the religion of the children of the forest. That's quite the change. How did that happen? Right? What could have caused the first men to abandon their former religions and start worshiping the weirwood trees, sometimes with blood, human sacrifice even? Well, there's a very obvious answer, and that's the long night. During the long night, almost everybody died. <laughs> so all the old traditions and cultures, a lot of them would have disappeared. They would have changed. People might have seen their former gods as abandoning them. And along comes the children of the forest. We know the children of the forest, what did they do during the long night? They helped the last hero. They helped the Night's Watch assemble and win the war for the dawn. And then we know that the Green Seers and the Night's Watchmen, rather, say their oaths to heart trees. The first men do. And all of the original Night's Watch were first men. <clears throat> Less than Ironborn snuck in there. But they're, they're all first men. So they would have said their oaths to the Weirwoods. So the watch was created by the children. They swear their oaths to the Green Seers in the trees. And the children help the Night's Watch. It all fits together very nicely. And so here we have the perfect explanation for why the first men would start worshiping the religion of the children 
and stop warring against them and become friends. It's because the children helped them not get exterminated. And so they would have seen the, the magic of the power of the weirwood magic. And they would have literally been grateful to the children and the green seers. So it all fits together very well. Hammer of the water sounds like a moon meteor and the pact between the children and the first men. The best explanation for it is the children helping the first men during the long night. So that is my timeline heresy. I have a stream of like a three hour live stream called timeline heresies, the pact and the hammer of the waters where I go into obviously more detail, but there you go. That was a fair amount of detail. So I already mentioned uh, a second ago that Bloodstone Emperor and Amethyst Empress might be Azor Ahai and Nissa Nissa. And this is one that, again, Durin Durned and came to before I did. But it's obviously true. So Bloodstone Emperor is said to usurp his sister, the Amethyst Empress, who was the rightful ruler killed her and a usurped her and this act was so horrible that it caused the maiden made of light the sun goddess to turn her back on the world that is the story mm. so it's a blood magic murder by an evil sorcerer bloodstone emperor is an evil sorcerer and he he murders the empress and this causes the long night well azor Ahai murdered nissa nissa and this broke the moon and I had already figured out that breaking the moon was probably the cause of the long night. Once you put that together, it fits together pretty well. The Bloodstone Emperor Azor High murdered the Amethyst Empress Nissa Nissa. This broke the moon and clouded the sun, caused the sun to hide its face, caused the long night. And Azor High is revealed as a dark sorcerer, killing his wife in blood magic. And the idea that Amethyst Empress was both sister and wife to Azor Ahai, the Bloodstone Emperor, makes sense. Because, of course, we know the Valerians have that tradition of marrying sister to brother. And these people would have been the ancestors of the Valerians. <clears throat> and let me also pull up uh, Atlantis Morissette's Gemstone Emperors. I mentioned them earlier and forgot to put them in this document. So I will open that up real quick. And here they are. This is, again, by Atlantis Morissette. She drew this on request for my Nightbringer videos. So check out the Nightbringer videos and check out Atlantis Morissette on Instagram. She's doing uh, an Inktober, so she's putting out one piece a day right now. So, <clears throat> so we'll get to Nissa Nissa and what color eyes she, she should have later. That's a different theory. But here is Danny sees kingly ghosts. Their eyes are opal, amethyst, tourmaline, and jade. Jesus Christ, dude. What the fuck are they doing upstairs? I know, girl. They just knocked something off my shelf. <clears throat> they have a kid. In any case, uh, opal, amethyst, tourmaline, and jade left to rice. That's what you're looking at. The blue guy is opal, purple, amethyst, tourmaline, which can come in several colors, which are represented here. You see the black and then the purple and turquoise and then jade. And here is my black tourmaline. I'll show you some black tourmaline in one second. Black tourmaline, there it is, there it is. A lot of tourmaline has the turquoise and purple, pink purple look. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, there we go. Thank you, Atlantis Morissette. So the idea is that the gemstone emperors have Valerian hair. And let me go back to, they've got Valerian looking hair, but the eyes are all different colors. The one with amethyst eyes looks like a Valerian. They all have silver, gold, platinum, white hair. So the one with purple eyes looks like Valeria, Valerians. But the other ones don't. So that tells us that the Great Empire of the Dawn probably had different ethnicities or tribes, you might say. 
sorry, I missed the mute button there. Um, and uh, the reason why we've got uh, different, like I said, when the Great Empire of the Dawn dissolves in its wake, we are left with several different peoples. We've got uh, the Yitish, the Shai, the Jogos Nai, the people of Nefer, the ancient empire of Herkun. So clearly the Great Empire of the Dawn, it was described as occupying basically all of Essos east of the bones. So anything that big, it's kind of like the Roman Empire or something like that. They would have been colonizing other peoples and these uh these emperors, the gemstone emperors, you know, tourmaline, jade, amethyst, whatever, whatever. And actually I have this picture up too. This is the king's list. So these these emperors, it's pretty obvious that they might be dynasties instead of individuals. They're said to rule for hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, so probably, I mean, they could have been magical people, obviously, but it's more likely they were dynasties. And so the different gemstones would indicate different eye colors and thus different tribes, something like that, right? Uh, Atlantis Morissette was in the chat. Not sure if she still is, but yeah, like I said, on Instagram at Atlantis Morissette. Very cool name. Uh, especially for an Atlantis, an Atlantophile like me. So there you go. Also, uh, Opal, Emperor, Opal Emperor, Amethyst Empress, and Bloodstone Emperor. It's kind of uh, an echo of something from the Silmarillion, Tar Palantir the was one of the last kings of Numenor his son was uh um Arpharazon the golden who married his cousin um by force who was the rightful heir and so mar by marrying her he usurped her and it's uh pretty close to the the downfall of Numenor story is very close to the downfall of the great empire of the dawn story with the Danes being the escaped uh, Edane, the Edine, the Dunedain, if you will. Dunedain, Dunedain, Dane, Dine. There you go. So the Bloodstone Emperor is the is uh, Azor High, and the Amethyst Empress is Nissa Nissa. I rate this to be very likely to be true. What do you guys think? I think that one is almost certainly true. Most people do say Edine, but it looks like Dane if you read it. So, oh, come on. It's not that bad in Europe. It's like midnight or something. Yeah. And of course, the Duna Dane have a whole bunch of uh, Venus and Morning Star symbolism. Uh, very much. Uh, yeah. So let's see, going, moving right along. Or is that pretty much it for, okay, that's all. Yeah, so we got our, our next levels coming up here. Level, time to go deeper. Level four, feast your eyes. Let me zoom in so you can see. Naga's ribs are a weird boat. Anar Targaryen plus the Faceless Men caused the doom. Green Zombie Watch, Green Seer Kings of Ancient Westeros. Knights, King, and Queen created the others. Nightford predates the wall. Well, you guys can read. These are the next theories. How am I 49ers doing? Mm, not that well. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So Naga's ribs are a weirwood boat. This one is not my theory. I provided a lot of evidence for it, but it is not mine. Somebody on the History of Westeros forum suggested it years and years ago. And I got as close as thinking that the ribs were weirwood trees and that thinking this was a weirwood circle, but it's actually a flipped over weirwood boat. So let me show you the proof. First of all, here is my favorite Naga's rib artwork. This is concept art for the TV show. I believe it's Character Design Studios. 
And this imagines the hall with a little bit of the stone left. This is not canon. There's no stone left, but we're told that he used the ribs for the pillars of his long haul. So this is how it would have looked at a certain point. Here's the thing. The Vikings have been making long hauls out of flipped over boat hauls for quite some time. As you can see in these pictures. On the left is this kind of a smaller version of it. Looks like basically just a little shed here. But this is a real island uh, somewhere in the British Isles where there's a whole bunch of buildings like this because it's an old tradition. On the right, you will see a more traditional Viking long haul. And you can see it looks like a flipped over boat because they use the same sort of carpentry in, uh, in both. And sometimes would even take boat holes, flip them over and use it as a roof. So. Now, sea dragons may exist. And the sea dragon is also a legend about a moon meteor because it says this, the sea dragon drowns whole islands in her wrath. So if a, if a meteor is a dragon, a dragon that l drowns islands and lives in the sea is probably just a memory of a meteor that hit near the sea and caused tidal waves, such as at the Arm of Dorne, and drowned the land. So that would be your sea dragon. So things things aren't uh, exclusive in A Song of Ice and Fire. You know, Lightbringer is, is a meteor, it's a comet, it's a dragon, it's a person, it's all the things. So, so too with Naga the sea dragon. It's definitely a meteor and it's definitely a weirwood boat that was flipped over <laughs> and made into a long haul. But there could have also been sea dragons. Why not? Um, let's see here. Where, let's see, where am I looking? Let's go back to the actual long haul artwork. So the, it's, the symbolism is not cryptic. Victorian describes the ribs as trees. They're like tall, pale trees. And he describes them as thick, as thick around as the mast of a ship. So he's telling you they're trees that were used as part of a ship. And then uh, it also forms a great metaphor which is that the Weirwoods are a ship for the green seers to sort of sail the green sea or the astral sea, the astral plane, the sea, the river of time. The Weirwoods are a vehicle and a vessel for the green seers. So we're going to get into the Grey King and the idea that he himself was a green seer. But the first thing you have to figure out is that Naga's ribs are Weirwood. And when, the, when you realize that they're in an arch, you put those clues together then you can figure it out. Oh, also there's a legend of the Grey King making a boat out of Weirwood. I forgot about that. <laughs> Literally, he said, to have made the first longship from the hard pale wood of Ig, a demon tree that feeds on human flesh. And of course, the Weirwoods are heavily based on Yggdrasil, the Norse world tree, magical tree. The Weirwoods are demon trees. They have demonic faces. They are given blood sacrifice. So the demon trees that eat flesh that have hard pale wood that was made into a boat, that's literally the story of the Grey King making a weirwood boat, or at least having one. And then there it is. There's the friggin' weirwood boat. So, yeah, it's... It, to me, that's canon. That is canon. Next up, we have... A, 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 T plus F, M equals D. Basically, Anar Targaryen plus the faceless men caused the doom. This is not my theory originally, but it is one for which I have provided a lot of evidence. <laughs> so that's funny, guys. Um, The thing that was knocked off my shelf was a child of the forest. So... There's a kid upstairs who created an earthquake. So the children caused the giants to awaken the earth. And it knocked a child off my shelf. I love that. That's uh <laughs> It's pretty funny. Symbolism happening live. 
So yes, the doom was an inside job is my video about this. A little snappier title. The doom was an inside job. So the first part of the theory is like, well, the faceless men are heavily implicated. They say they had something to do with it. And we know that the doom was caused by the eruption of all the volcanoes on the Valerian Peninsula. We also know that the Valerian mages banked the fires of the 14 flames to keep them from erupting. Because remember, Valeria existed for 5,000 years living on top of volcanoes. So clearly they were maintaining an equilibrium in the volcanoes. That's a lot of fire magic, by the way. But essentially their Valerian mages learned how to keep the volcanoes at an even boil. It's implied that they're sources of magic. But the point is that they were kept in check with magic at the very least. So the most obvious way that the faceless men could cause the doom would simply be by assassinating the mages. And assassination is, of course, what the faceless men do. So that's very simple. A lot of people have put that together. The faceless men caused the doom. That's basically canon. They claim to have done it. And I'm just pouring a little more tea, guys. So one second. Now, Anor Targaryen, well, his name crops up because he just happens to be the only one left with dragons after the doom. Now, the story is that his daughter, Daenys, the age of 12, foresaw the doom. Actually, no, I don't know how old she was. It was 12 years before the doom. She had a dream and saw it. And so Anor Targaryen, having an awful lot of faith, in the dreams of his daughter, picked up his belongings and moved his entire family to Dragonstone. So we are told. The thing is that he had a lot of reason to move to Dragonstone anyway. The narrow sea trade was very good. The Valerians and Celtigars and Targaryens grew rich off of controlling the sea trade. And Dragonstone was already a Valyrian outpost before the Targaryens got there. So it could be that Aenar made a savvy move to Dragonstone to become wealthy. Um, and also they were selling Valyrian steel to Westeros for a couple hundred years before the Doom. And there's over 270 Valyrian steel weapons in Westeros. That All of that trade, it's implied, went through Dragonstone. So the Targaryens would have been making a lot of money on Dragonstone, both from uh, monopolizing the trade and from selling Valerian steel. So then the doom happens 12 years after they move there. And they're the only ones left with dragons. There's a couple of dragon lords in a couple of the free cities that are, that are cast down. But, uh, oh, look, it's 420. Consider this picture of Anar Targaryen for one moment. If my voice was better and we had more time, I would sing to you my cover of um, Fire and Rain by James Taylor, which uh, describes uh, the doom. I did all the verses and it's very good, but I'm not going to sing right now. So different time. Really good lyrics, too. So, uh, Inar Targaryen is the only one left with dragons. So maybe he engineered the doom to get a dragon monopoly, right? Mm. 
the thing is that uh, he didn't do anything with the Dragon Monopoly once he had it. He did not invade Westeros. It wasn't for another hundred years until Aegon the Conqueror invaded Westeros. And Aegon the Conqueror only used one dragon that came from Valyria. Um, Aenar left with five, and then a hundred years later, only one of those five is still alive, which is Balerion. And Vagar and Naraxes were born on Dragonstone. So they only took five dragons, and a hundred years later, they only have three. So it's not even like they were breeding dragons until they could invade Westeros. Aenar did not invade Westeros. He did nothing. He just sat on, on Dragonstone and retired and lived and grew old and bounced his children on his knee and shit. That's, that's what Aenar did. Now, he did grow very wealthy, like I said, from the trade. But he did not use his dragon monopoly to conquer anything. And neither did his children. It wasn't for a hundred years. So by the time Aegon had this idea, I think it was his own idea. It was not a long term plan by Aenar. So we have to rule that motivation out. Aenar did not, if he conspired with the Faithless Men, he did not do it to be the only one left with dragons. But what I what I um, suggested is that what what if Aenar Targaryen was was actually John Brown, an abolitionist, if you will. Think about this. The Valerians, the word Arian is in Valerian for it's not a not a coincidence. Um, Valeria is very much they are very much Nazis with dragons. Um, not in every sense, you know, the targ the Valerian race supremacy had a practical reason, right? They weren't trying to exterminate other races. They were basically they they kept their bloodlines pure for reasons of dragon magic to ride the dragons. Um, they did end up doing some genocide though. Uh maybe just through the course of feeding thousands of people to their mines to mine gold and shit like that. But um, they did basically depopulate Essos and what, how, whatever you want to make of that parallel. Valeria was awful. They were a slave empire and they existed for 5,000 years. The Roinar were the most powerful civilization that came up against them. Sarnor, nobody could defeat Valeria. Um, the, the Valeria destroyed the original Giscari civilization. So there's no stopping Valeria. 5,000 years. Just imagine some equivalent of the Nazis with dragons ruling for 5,000 years. It's the most awful thing you could think of. Um, it really was awful. Okay, so now maybe if you're a rich person in one of the free cities, you could be like, hey, this is not so bad. Uh, but if you're anybody that crosses Valeria, again, they depopulated, they wiped out whole civilizations. Um, so the point is, not to just sermonize about how, how evil Valeria was, the point is, if you know how, nobody, no civilization is a monolith. There would have been some Valerians that didn't like what was going on. There would have been some Valerians that were like, hey guys, this is wrong. There might have been an anti-slavery party in the Valerian, you know, uh, politic, political games. Like we're told they had 40 ruling families and there was lots of politics and stuff. There's no king of Valeria. So however power, however the, the power was divided, there must have been some kind of Senate or voting body made up of, uh, <clears throat> made up of, um, you know, the ruling families. And so those families all would have had different interests. Uh, there's a line about the Targaryen dragons being bred for war, which implies there were dragons bred for other purposes. And of course, we know that dragons were used to build castles and roads. And I've often pointed out, you wouldn't want a vicious, aggressive battle dragon like Balerion the Black Dread to work with the road crew <laughs> and pave thousands of miles of highway. You'd want a docile dragon that's used to strangers that works on command and just chills, burns the next section of stone when they need it, moves up a little bit, then waits. You want a chill dragon for that. And we're, we're shown that dragons who live in King's Landing and don't do a lot of battle, they grow fat and lazy and more docile. They're still dragons, but they grow more docile. 
<clears throat> so we know that the, the Targaryens, for example, did not bring any um, uh, dragon horns that we know of. They might have had glass candles, but if they did, that's a secret. Uh, they didn't bring the secret of forging Valyrian steel. So a lot of Valyrian technology did not make it to Dragonstone. It's possible that the Targaryens weren't in possession of those powers. It was other families that had that. Or it could be that Aenar chose not to carry on the traditions that require blood magic. Valerian steel requires blood magic, for sure. And the Dragonbinder horn probably does too. It seems to. <clears throat> not probably, it does. Um, so basically what I'm getting around to saying is that if you were somebody that wanted to stop, that thought that Valeria was evil, you're one of the Valerians with a conscience. You think this shit is bad. And you can see that this has gone on for thousands of years. And you can see another 5,000 years stretching out in front of you and the rest of the world. So what do you do? How do you stop Valeria? They have hundreds of dragons. You can't fight them. The Roinar learned that. How do you stop them? The only way to bring down Valeria was the doom, something like the doom. So what I believe is that Aenar Targaryen worked with the Faceless Men to cause the doom for reasons of morality. Meaning that he realized the only way to stop another 5,000 years of Valerian genocide was to literally blow up the entire nation. So that means a, a bunch more slaves would die as well. Innocent people would die. So it's a very, it's a morally gray action, to be sure. He would have been genociding his own people. But you can certainly see the rationale for, for it. Because how else would you stop them? There is no other way. There's no negotiating. There's no fighting them. There's nothing. So he might have burned it all down. And in our Targaryen being um, an, an abolitionist dragon lord who founded House Targaryen would then find its completion in Daenerys, who uses her dragons to free slaves all throughout uh, A Storm of Swords, A Dance with Dragons, and A Clash of Kings. Mostly Storm and Dance, but you get the point. Danny is an abolitionist dragon lord. She's going to go to Volantis and free some more slaves. So Aenar Targaryen causing the doom for reasons of morality would, would make sense thematically with the story. And to me, it fits all the facts. So that's my theory on that. And you can find the doom was an inside job and the doom was an abolition on my YouTube page in a playlist called The Doom. Might have to pick up the pace here. Green zombie watch. It's another picture of cold hands. Yes. <clears throat> so I already kind of explained part of this. Jon Snow is about to be an undead night's watchman. And he's a skin changer. So we know that his spirit is going to rest in his wolf. It's not just going to dissipate. And when he gets called back, his spirit is going to go from his wolf back to his body. I've theorized that the wolf spirit's going to come along and they're going to be merged. But the point is that John's wolf acts as a soul jar for his soul. <clears throat> and somebody pointed out that there might be a word pun with soldier pines as soul jar pines, because the soldier pines are used as weirwood symbols and the weirwoods are soul jars. So maybe they're soul jar pines. And the soldier pines are also used to um depict trees turning to warriors and uh that's what the green zombie watch would be but in any case the idea here is that when we hear about the last hero dying or not dying but his 12 companions died well those 12 companions i think they were resurrected as the first night's watch cold hands could be one of those dozen but even if he's not cold hands is showing us something very important he's showing us the ideal ranger to range the haunted forests and the frozen north. Right? He's showing us that somebody who's undead doesn't have to eat or sleep and doesn't fear the cold 
So all the hazards of the haunted forest for living people, they don't phase cold hands. The only thing he's worried about is fire. So he can even get stabbed potentially and not die because he's a white. So main thing is that he can, he doesn't have to sleep. He doesn't have to eat and he doesn't worry about the cold. So he is the perfect ranger for the North. John is about to become a zombie. We don't know if it'll be ice or fire white or maybe even a green white. If there is such a thing, the point is that undead Night's Watch Rangers are the perfect Rangers. John's going to be one. Cold Hands is one. And so the last hero who had 12 companions who died and then later assembled the first men of the Night's Watch. Well, those could have been the same men, the Green Zombie Watch. There's a lot more to this theory, but that's the gist of it. You can check out Green Zombies 1, 2, and 3 in a Green Zombie playlist. But also, I want you to watch Melisandre's Secrets Part 4, Chosen of Relore, which will have an updated version of part of the Green Zombies theory. So I don't want to go too far into that. <clears throat> uh, microphone sipping again. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Sorry. I'm doing my best. There's a lot of great fun word clues about green zombies theory. It's a really fun theory. Um, what do you guys, that's one I want to ask you on the percentages. I, I forgot to keep, keep up with that, but what do you guys think? What, 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 what are the percentages that, uh, that I'm right about that, that the last heroes 12 were undead. And uh, you know, I haven't checked my email. You guys can, of course, support the program via PayPal. Such as James did. He's asking a follow-up to the Valerians are lizard people theory. He's saying, if the Valerians have dragon blood, do you think it's possible the dragons might have human blood? They are very intelligent creatures. Yes, that is possible. And it's even more possible that there is the spirit of a dead dragon lord inside the dragon and that that is part of the dragon bond i should have put that theory on here actually yeah that, that's another way they could be the blood of the dragon um if there's some way for a, a dragon to hold a human spirit so we're pretty high on the green zombies percentages that's good of course this is a home crowd here you guys are going to be favorable, of course. I appreciate that. But I do think it's a pretty solid theory. Oh, uh, yeah. So Mithras from the Westeros.org forums came up with a specific theory about the Valerians. Um, you know those uh, little those lemurs that look like Valerians? They're called little Valerians. They have silver hair and purple eyes. Well, the word lemur means ghost. And lemurs look weird. They have big ghostly looking eyes. That's why they're called that. But lemur means ghost. And so the reason why George might have made little Valerians that are lemurs is to tell us that there's something, the Valerians are ghosts somehow. And, you know, um, or you could say that, here's the here's way how you'd say it. Um, Valerian ghosts live inside animals. Okay. Lemur ghosts look like Valerians. So you could say that, these Valerian ghosts look like animals. So maybe Valerian ghosts live inside dragons and that that's part of the dragon bond. That's probably the best way to say that. Uh, let's see, the nine pointed open crown. Could it once have been a 12 or 13 pointed crown broken by Brandon the Breaker? That's really cool. No, no, I like this. So, okay, hang on. So the King of Winter crown is as a bronze and iron circlet with nine irons, uh, long sword spikes. Um, I've compared that to the weirwood grove of nine, which has nine weirwood trees in a circle. Um, there's a lot of symbolism tying them together. The, the weirwood trees are crowned with a head of red leaves. So it implies a weirwood crown. Naga's Hill is crowned with four, four and 40 weirwoods. <clears throat> so we got this weirwood crown idea. And we're going to talk about the Grey King was a green seer in a second. He he wore a weirwood crown. So that, that all ties together. Now, 
it's an open circlet. So perhaps it's missing a piece. And it was originally a 12 pointed crown for the original Night's Watch or something like that. Interesting, interesting. And of course, Night's King has a bunch of 13s in his mythology. I like that. That's that's a pretty good theory for just throwing it in there. Nice job. All right, so let's take down this cold hands picture. Where are you, cold hands picture? There we go. And talk about, since I just mentioned it, let's talk about the Grey King being a green seer. Oh, that's further down. We're not there yet. Forget I said anything. So green seer king's theory. This is another pretty logical one. I could have put this up higher, I think. Basically, it's consider the example of Vermeer Sixkins is what I'm talking about. Vermeer Sixkins is a petty man. He's not a very strong skin changer. Um, and yet he sets himself up as a petty lord. He uses his, his shadow cat um, to basically force women to rape women. He, he uses his shadow cat to bring women to his cave and compel and he compels them to uh and he rapes them and uh trying to have basically he's looking for more green seer children he's frustrated because none of his children have the gift but basically he rules as a, a petty tyrant it's one of the worst people in the story but at the same time he's also very much like a lot of people he's simply somebody who's abusing power abuse of power is a major theme of the story and we see it all over the place. Every form of power is abused. Magical power, political power, anything. And so it's a, it's a logical exercise. If there were green seers and skin changers in the ancient past of Westeros, when we're told that there was a hundred petty kings, it's pretty natural that skin changers and green seers would have been kings more often than not. They would have had power that was very much godlike power. The green seers and skin changers, the skin changers can use their animals to attack people. And we, we're, we're told that there are wars involving warg kings and House Stark. And the thing about green seers, this is the main part of the theory, really, is I noticed that uh, Bran, you know, he sits on the weirwood throne and eats a weirwood paste and he has his first set of visions. But then he goes to bed. He's carried to his bedchamber. He's no longer on a weirwood throne. And he goes to sleep and has a whole bunch of more weirwood visions. Okay? So we're, that shows us two things. A, green seers, once they have a link to the tree, they can see visions from the tree without sitting on the weirwood throne and without being wired in permanently like Blood Raven is. So Bran is a child, and he's crippled, and he's in the far north. So all of those things make him not a physical threat. But imagine Bran is young Robert Baratheon instead. And imagine that Weirwood tree is not in the frozen north. He does not have to sit on the Weirwood throne to use his magic. Once he's eaten the Weirwood paste and formed a connection to the tree, he can then walk around and use his green seer power, use his sight, use his knowledge, use his ability to inhabit the skin of any animal to see anything that's going on anywhere. So look into the eyes of this man on your screen here. The terrifying face of the Green Seer King. His power would be godlike. And so it's just inevitable that not all of these people would be good people. Some of them would be like Veramir or like Ramsey Bolton or Euron Greyjoy. And even if they weren't evil, they would be they would be people that now, other people would naturally turn to to lead their tribe or lead their village. He'd be the most powerful warrior to defend them against the evil tribes and kings. So it's very inevitable that wargs and green seers would have been the kings of ancient Westeros. They would have been the first kings. And so we see the Starks in the crypts of Winterfell, and all the ancient kings of winter have direwolves at their sides. 
of course, they were skin changer and green seer kings going back to ancient day. That's why they were consistently kings, the Starks, because they had a strong skin changer bloodline. And we see that with six children being born with the gift at once. So there you go. Very solid theory. Check out um, King Bran 1, 2, and 3. I think the first one is called Green Seer Kings of Ancient Westeros. And it's got the, the longer version of this theory. Oh, and this art is um, Exiled Druids of Lornwood by Timu Huso. Uh, and that Cold Hands, that's Didier Graffé. Okay, so the Night Fort predates the Wall. And just real quickly, I will say, guys, it's not a great day for questions. Obviously, I've got a ton of material here. Um, but if you do want to support the program, paypal.me, Mythical Astronomy, right here. This is a way to do it. You can send in a donation. And if you do send in a question um, that is complimentary to one of these theories, I can read it today. Or I can take it next time I do a Q&A. So always appreciate the paypal.me donations. Thank you, friends. And we're back at the Night Fort. So the Night Fort has a weirwood tree growing up from it. It actually doesn't have a face. This one does have a face. And this image is by uh, Iveson Wild, I-V-S-O-N Wild, Iveson Wild or Iveson Wild. And um, it's, uh, it's great because we didn't have much Night Fort art. So in the middle of the Night Fort kitchens, and you can see the hearths here, there is a skinny weirwood pushing up through the flagstones towards the broken dome where it's reaching towards the moon and the sun and cool stuff like that. But the main point is that it's breaking up through the flagstone. So it's growing up from the ground. Then we go down the well. We go down the well shaft and we find the black gate, right? The black gate is a talking weirwood face. It's one of the weirdest things in the whole story. We've never seen weirwood faces move or talk. And this one does. And it's underground. So what the hell? We don't know what's going on there. But the point is that they're at least 50 feet or so below the ground, probably more. Um, when they look back up to the top of the well shaft, it says it's about the size of a moon at the top. So it's pretty. they're pretty far down, several, several stories, and they find this weirwood face. So it's pretty obvious that the tree breaking up through the kitchens is actually connected to the ball of roots that is going 50 and 80 feet below the ground. We see the same thing at Blood Raven's Cave. The weirwood roots go down and down and down. They go pretty far underground. The roots are everywhere and they're very thick. They're not skinny and tailing off. They're not little tap roots. They're like thick roots all twisted on top of each other. So the weirwoods have a bunch of mushroom symbolism. Blood Raven has a mushroom growing on his cheek and there's fungus symbolism and I don't even want to go into it. But the point is that the weirwoods are essentially like a mushroom organism in that most of the organism is under the underground. And the trees on top are like the mushroom caps that pop up. In case you didn't know, that's how mushrooms work. They're an underground organism. And then when it rains, they pop up caps. The caps die or get picked or eaten. But the thing is underground. So weirwood trees look like um, fly agaric mushrooms, the red and white caps, the ones like in Super Mario Brothers. If you look at it, yes, that's it. You'll never see Super Mario Brothers or the Weirwoods the same. Mario eats the mushrooms and powers up, and Bran eats the mushroom paste, the Weirwood paste. And eventually he'll grow a mushroom on his face like Blood Raven. But the point is, at both Blood Raven's cave and the Night Fort, you can see that most of the Weirwood organism is underground and that the trees pop up. And this is also, it lends, it lends into the, uh, it lends into the, um, the idea that uh, there, the weirwood paste, which is described as a paste of weirwood seeds, is actually Jojen paste. And my gods, I think I forgot to put Jojen paste on here. 
Oh, that's going to be in the current. Oh, that's right. That's in the current theories, not the ancient Lord theories. So my theory here about the Weirwoods is that if the Black Gate is one of the most unique Weirwood organisms anywhere, and the Weirwoods live forever if undisturbed, it seems pretty obvious that the Night Fort was built around the Weirwood tree, just as Winterfell was said to be built around its Weirwood tree. And just as all of the first man castles are built around the weirwood trees. Um, we're, we're specifically told that uh, the weirwood tree at Winterfell watched Brandon the Builder set the first stone. I think that's true. And it makes sense. Again, go back to the, my timeline heresy about the pact. The children of the forest helped the first men survive the long night. That is why they switched their religion and started worshiping the weirwoods. So all of the castles that we have, the ancient castles and these ancient houses, Baratheon, Lannister, or uh, before Lannister, Casterly, Stark, these all these ancient First Men castles are built around weirwood trees. That's because weirwood trees are sources of magic. And underneath weirwood trees are always the hollow hills. Shout out to Wiz the Smith and his hollow hills essay. We always have these protected caves. Um, they're frequently warded. Blood Raven's cave is warded. Storm's End is warded. The wall is magically warded. Probably the Winterfell crypts are warded. So you can see um, these are like outposts against the others. Winterfell's built over a hot springs. So it's the ideal out, outpost against the winter. <clears throat> but you definitely want a weirwood tree. So if you follow this logic, you see that First men castles are built around weirwood trees. And the Night's Watch weirwood is very big. The organism is huge, which means it's very old and it's very powerful. This black gate is unique. So what I suspect is that the order goes like this. The Night Fort was built around the weirwood organism here. And the Night Fort is supposedly the first castle built on the wall. Well, I think the Night Fort probably predates the wall. And in fact, the location of the wall would have been chosen because of the weirwood organism at the Night Fort. And it's very possible that there are more weirwood trees embedded in the wall and that the weirwood magic was even used to create the wall. No matter who built it, I think that's very possible and likely. So that's my theory, is that the Night Fort predates the wall. Um, Azor High who I think, again, was Night's King, probably came here, and this was probably an outpost of the first men that he took over because of the weirwood organism here, possibly. The Night Fort is where um, Night's King and Queen made the others. So the creation of the others is this one-time miraculous act, at least the first time it happened. It was some sort of unprecedented, abominable magic. And it happened at the Night Fort where we have this very unique weirwood organism. So it's very possible that the weirwood magic is involved in all of that. So I think that the weirwood organism is central here. The Night Fort would have been built around it and the wall after that. So that's my theory and I'm sticking to it. So let's let's zoom out here for a second, see where, how we're doing. We are four levels down gods what sort of madness is down on this bottom level and how long will it take me to get there we're almost at two hours here i'm feeling pretty good though I see I've got over 400 people watching, 415. Hopefully we'll get to 420 shortly. If you're watching right now, please do click the like button so the stream gets noticed by YouTube. I did my best to rip off Alt-Shift-X's theory iceberg thing. And uh, hopefully YouTube will associate this video with a very successful Alt-Shift-X. Um, but you guys can help by pressing the like button. And it seems like they're doing construction upstairs now that's cool that, that that's cool click the like also i will remind you that um 
put the camera on me so make this personal uh guys i promise you youtube changes your subscription preferences even if you've clicked the like bell and set it to all notifications periodically if you don't watch my videos fast enough or for whatever mysterious reasons youtube changes it so everyone that's watching even if you're like one of my mods and you watch all my videos check right now click the subscription bell and make sure it's set to all notifications so you don't miss a stream or video and they're absolutely doing some sort of construction upstairs um <laughs> okay cool hopefully that's not coming through too bad i think it's just annoying me and we're to 420 thank you guys thank you <laughs> i don't even know what that is okay so uh sounds like they're buffing the floor with like a buffer or something <laughs> So the next theory is, can you guys hear that? <laughs> yeah, it's, it sounds like a vacuum kind of. All right, cool. So whatever. I'll just talk and it'll drown it out. So this next theory is called Relore Ahai. Let me zoom in a bit on this fantastic Relore artwork, which hopefully you have uh, seen in my new Fire Whites video. And in fact... In, to give my voice a quick break, what I'm going to do now is play a little teaser clip from the Fire Whites video that I put out only two days ago, and I know a lot of you have not watched it yet. YouTube tells me these things. So I'm going to share a little sneak peek. Actually... Enjoy. So you can see how it all kind of fits together. The Reloris preserve the prophecies and legends of Azor High and believe that he can raise the dead. And they just happen to know how to make fire whites that can light their swords on fire. They call Azor Ahai the warrior of fire and the champion of Relore, who is himself an embodiment of magical fire, basically. And they seem to know the secret of transforming people into fire others. And I want to tell you that in part four, we will take this idea further and ponder the possibility of such an army of fire sword wielding fire whites being created at the wall to fight the others in the upcoming war for the dawn infinity war which is obviously coming at the end of the story this is preview number one and here's number two and i'll expand on this in just a second This actually isn't generic salvation or afterlife talk here. A promise of heavenly reward for the loyal soldiers of Azor High. No, I think that when they speak of death itself bending the knee to Azor High, warrior of fire, and of people who fight for him being reborn, we should think in very literal terms here. Azor High and his mages may well have actually been warriors of fire, as in walking human torches. And perhaps those who died fighting alongside him were indeed reborn, right there on the spot, just as Beric was. This would mean that Azor Ahai and the magic wielders of his day are in fact the origin of and or the inspiration for the Relorist religion. And that would certainly make a ton of sense, wouldn't it? It would certainly explain why they're so concerned about the second coming of Azor Ahai, a figure whose legend comes from a shy, which in turn gives us another reason why the Red Priests want to go to a shy to study. Their religion is founded or heavily influenced by a guy from a shy. Was that um, was that like uh, jilted for any of you? Um, the the playback for me was not a little a little bit um unsmooth. Uh, Get camera just where I want. There we go. Give you guys a little 
little cross angle today so I can get my nice Kali. Uh, by the way, this is from uh, uh, Pale Horse Designs, my, my Kali image. They make very cool prints and T-shirts. Uh, very cool dude. He's got a YouTube channel, too, where he explains all the symbolism behind his art. So Pale Horse Designs. Check them out. Uh, Cleo, come here, girl. Sit up. <clears throat> so the, the Relora High theory is kind of just what I was hinting at. The idea that Relorism uh, is essentially... Uh, yeah, so it was, it was a little choppy, that last one. Yeah, so I'm not sure why. But you can go check out the full 26-minute video in uh, full HD glory <laughs> on uh, over there. So Rosicrucianism, only a little bit Christian law. Uh, it overlaps with like, uh, you know, some of my alchemy research and things like that. But I, I haven't, the rosy cross, you're comparing the rosy cross. Okay, um, I'm having some some issues there. Hang on, let me make sure. It did that thing where my mic turned off and then it switched to the wrong mic and I got to put it back. <clears throat> there we go. Sorry, I'm not sure if that was like my internet or if that was... Uh, yeah, that wasn't a mute. That wasn't my fault. That was the thing where the, the StreamYard glitches and it derecognizes the microphone for a second. So there we go. Uh, I think we're back on track here. Hello. What was I saying? So the video played a little bit choppy, uh, but of course you can check out the full video, Fire Whites, Melisandre Secrets Part 3, on uh, on my YouTube channel. And the question about Rosicrucianism and the Rosy Cross, I was just about to say, Christian, hit me up on social media and let's talk about this. This is, uh, I'd like to hear what you have to say and develop this line of thinking. I'm at the Dragon LML on Twitter, and I am at David Lightbringer on Instagram. Either one works. Probably Twitter's better, but whichever you're on. Or if you're on Facebook, you can check out the Mythhead family uh, group. And if someone could share that link, one of my mods, that'd be cool. <clears throat> yeah, so usually the playback of the videos doesn't cause anything to screw up, but I don't know. Who knows? In any case... Y'all got the general idea. The general idea is that Relorism goes back to Azor High and the events of the Long Night. So the main powers of Relorism, and this is kind of the whole point of the Melisandre's Secrets video, is I'm showing you what fire magic can do, what it has done, so that we can predict what it will do. So part four is going to be the prediction part where I'm going to show you what it's going to do. Um, let me put up my Relore artwork again. I took that down accidentally. So this is, this art is Relore by Latino-com-R. I triple checked. Sounds like an address. It is the name, Latino-com-R. That's the artist. And I am very grateful to them for creating this art. I got a lot of mileage out of it in the Melisandre's, um, in the Melisandre's series. <laughs> a lot of mileage. So this is R'hllor. Um, R'hllor does not exist, in my opinion. I don't think there are gods in A Song of Ice and Fire. However, magic can is either a source of power, or you might say it's a conduit of power. Ice magic, fire magic, water magic, blood magic, tree magic, etc., Dragonglass is cooled magma, and so therefore it has fire magic power and kills ice demons. Yeah, the Discord got shut down. So, guys, I'm not going to do any sort of chat thing where side chat rooms can be created. That, to me, is the common toxic element of Slack and Discord and all those other groups. If people can spawn separate chat rooms, things get fragmented and clicky, and that's when the shit talk happens and all sorts of weird shit. It happens every time, no matter how good your little Slack group is for a while, eventually it gets all freaking weird. So we, the Facebook group exists because it is all public. There's only one group and everyone can see everything. So that's how I prefer to do all of my community talk and stuff 
um, it's good for everyone to see everything anyways, because uh it's fun to you know see people talking about symbolism and theories and stuff so that is just there will never be any other discord groups or anything where there are side rooms i have learned that lesson trails off stares into distance yes that's right girl Those people are toxic and jealous and gossipy and we, we don't do side chat rooms do we girl no, that's where all the trouble starts, isn't it, girl? Yeah, we, we know about that. Cleo knows. Cleo knows. All right, so sorry, I'm having a little fun. It's a long stream. I got to have some fun. So R'hllor is a personification of fire magic. Um, we humans already do this with the forces of nature, sea gods, sky gods, sun gods, anything that's powerful and governs our life and is a one of those titanic forces it's going to be perceived as a deity, a god, a goddess, something, monster, whatever. So in this world, you know, like we already have fire gods in, in the real world. But if fire was magical, you'd be even more likely to perceive it as a god and worship it. And that's what Relorism is. But specifically, like I said, it's not really a religion so much as it is a set of magics uh, that have to do with fire around which a religion has formed. So the main things that we see with Relorism is it can raise the dead. We can see the future. Um, we can, Melisandre is transforming her physiology, which I call fire other. She's turning into a fire other, but basically what it means is just that she doesn't eat or sleep anymore. She is sustained by Relor, which means fire magic. So through using fire magic over time, Melisandre is very old. We don't know how old maybe a couple centuries, maybe many centuries. Sorry, it's, uh, and yes, Facebook is garbage, but the face, a lot of people are on Facebook and the group works okay. So I will just say that although first Facebook is a frustrating experience, um, the group is kind of fun. But if you're not on Facebook for more reasons, good for you. Uh, I mean, we should all not be on social media. There's lots of ethical issues, but let's not get, let's not get caught up in that. So the whole point is again, fire whites, the idea of people that could transform their nature like Melisandre into a fiery entity, perhaps a fiery opposite of an other. These are things that tie to Azor High because he was a warrior of fire. And it said all those who die fighting in his cause will be reborn. And it says that he has a flaming sword. And we've seen that people who die fighting for Relore can be reborn. And when they're reborn as a fire white, they have the power of lighting their swords on fire. Barak can light his own sword on fire because his blood is magical. He's, I call it powered by R'hllor, but his blood is black and it's hot. And it's, it's when it runs on the steel, it lights it on fire. So that tells you the fire magic mojo is now in Barak's undead black blood. Okay. So when we hear these legends about this hero with a flaming sword, it was a warrior of fire and raised his friends from the dead. Well, we can see what the truth of that is. Like that was the story of Azor High, who was a warrior of fire and raised the dead, or maybe his his fire priests raised the dead. Um, I'm going to get into the idea of the original Night's Watch being fire whites, but you can see that fire whites. You know, I made the point that cold hands. He doesn't have to worry about you know eating or sleeping or the cold. Well, it's unclear how a fire white would handle the cold. Potentially, they would be unfazed by the cold. Hard to say. But they don't need to eat or sleep. So that part they've got. And the ability to make a flaming sword anytime is pretty handy if you're fighting the other. So the theory is that Relorism is basically dates back to the fire magic practices of Azor High and the original Night's Watch. It has a connection to Westeros. And that is why all these Reloris are showing up in Westeros. Um, there you go. So that is Relore, a high theory. And again, please check out Melisandre Secrets 3, Fire Whites, which is not off to quite as good of a start as the other two Melisandre's videos for whatever reason. I did sort of do a live stream right after the premiere, which kind of sabotaged its success potentially. But uh, here's a fun one. Uh, it's time to talk about Io and Europa. Moons of ice and fire is the cause of the weird seasons. 
and I am very pleased to share this artwork from Philip Ehrlich. Philippe Ehrlich. And let me zoom out. It's a picture of two moons in a comet. It's a picture of a train and it's a... Oh, sorry, I can't do my... Uh, <clears throat> uh, from the Simpsons, the nerdy kid. Uh, it has a picture of a train and it says choo-choo. I, I just can't do the falsetto voice right now. Sorry. In any case, what caused the weird seasons is one of the big mysteries that George has said he will reveal, right? He has said that people... in the Back in the day, people... People were um, emailing George and suggesting uh, astrophysics. Ralph Wiggum, thank you. Astrophysics related reasons like axial tilt, two sun system, um, things like that. And George, in a public forum, has said, It's not that. It's not, don't think about, you know, astrophysics. Don't think about that kind of answer. It's not hard sci fi. It's going to be a magical based answer. It's fantasy. Specifically, he's talking about the seasons when he said that. Not the long night, but the seasons. Now, <clears throat> the the long night is probably tied to... Uh, I was talking about Ralph. Yeah, Milhouse is the nerdy one. Yeah, Ralph is just special. <laughs> um, in any case, so... Uh, one of the big mysteries is what... So we need a magical... A ma I choo choo choose you. Thank you. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. We need a magical explanation for the seasonal weirdness. Now, because it's a matter, well, this is a very important point I want to make because people use that quote to refute my entire long night theory. Oh, George said it's not a it's not a science reason, it's magic. Well, <clears throat> my moon meteor theory is a magic theory. It is not a science-based theory. Okay. Um, if the moon blew up, we would all die. And it's not, we would die many times over. Several apocalypses would hit the earth, fire and water and pressure and all kinds of horrible things. Be a complete baptism of the earth. And that would be true even if the moon was smaller and further away. In order for the moon to break and not destroy the earth, it would have to be very small. Think like Deimos of the moon of Mars is very small. Something like that, perhaps. Um, of course, then it really couldn't cause an eclipse either. But you see my point. Um, also, it, when you're talking about the meteor impacts, like we need a very precisely sized meteor to cause a, a, a global winter, but not kill everyone. George has not calculated how big that meteor should be. Anything like that. That's not this, this theory. Also, if a comet hit a moon, it doesn't blow up the moon. Um the comet would have to be the size of the moon itself to do that. So again, it would have to be a very tiny little moon, in which case it would probably not even be visible or barely visible. So there's a lot of physics problems with what I'm proposing. A giant comet sword plunges into the heart of the moon and explodes it. Some of those dragons fall to Earth. And we've got one moon left. So... Moons of Ice and Fire is how I explain this. Uh, the series is a song of ice and fire. Everything is dualistic, ice and fire. So if we had two moons in the sky, what the fuck do you think they were? <laughs> they were moons of ice and fire, okay? Um, then we have the idea that the moons are paralleled by moon maidens, such as Nissa Nissa and Daenerys and Lyanna and Night's Queen and all these other people. Well, Night's Queen, his skin is as pale as the moon, but she's cold and icy and has icy children. And her children, the others, have star eyes. So they are like meteor children. So just as the moon gives birth to dragons, Night's Queen gives birth to star children. But it's all icy. Melisandre is a fire moon person. And so she has these shadow babies from Stannis's life fires and does fire magic. Daenerys is a fire moon queen. Her children are dragons. On and on and on. Uh, Visenya is an ice moon queen. She creates the King's Guard, and the King's Guard are perfect symbolic parallels to the others. Hopefully, you guys know about that. I should have put that on here. I guess um, I didn't. This is really theories, though. I didn't put just basic symbolic parallels. But if you're sketchy on that, the King's Guard wear snow white armor. They're called white shadows. 
They're ghostly in the moonlight. If you take the Kingsguard descriptions and just pull them out of the chapters, they're exactly the same as the others. <clears throat> and Aegon and Visenya parallel Knights, Queen, and King, creating the others. Visenya creates the Kingsguard to uh, protect to protect uh, Aegon. And so, so too, the, the others are created potentially to protect Knights, King, and Queen. So Moons of Ice and Fire, like I said, it follows the ice and fire dichotomy of the story. And again, all the women that match the moons either go to ice and fire. Sometimes they do a transformation, but it's always ice and fire. We also see places that symbolize the moons. And we see fire moons and ice moon places that are consistent. Um, if you missed the uh, Exile of the Others live stream that we did last week, that was a humdinger. And we went through a whole bunch of the ice moon places in the story and like 10 of them and showed you how they have the, all the same symbolism about weirwoods and the others and icy moon meteors. And it's the same for the fire moon places. Fire moon places are places where dragons come from, like the dragon pit on the hill of Rainies. I said Visenya is the ice queen. Rainies is the fire queen. They each have a hill. The hill of Visenya has a white marble temple. Sept of Baylor and the warrior sons also parallel the others. The heel of Rainies has a smashed up home of dragons, and uh, Valeria was a home of dragons, it's smashed up. A shy was a home of dragons, it's smashed up. Uh, Dragonstone is not smashed up yet, but it is a volcano, which means it's only a matter of time before it blows up. So it seems like the moon that blew up in the past would be the red one, the smaller one here, the fire moon. And the one that's left would be the ice moon. Um, this would kind of explain what's going on. So if the seasons, and this is where the seasons come in, if you have a magic moons spinning around the planet in perfect harmony, those moons potentially might be tied to the seasons, might be tied to the balance of hot and cold on the planet again thinking in a fantasy kind of way so if you blow up the fire moon and pieces of its burnt body fall to the earth and embed themselves in places like a shy and we see this oily black stone you can basically think about the oily black stone as the burnt body of the fire moon that's its corpse and that's why it's all toxic and shadowed and that's why we've got a heart of winter and a heart of shadow. Shouldn't we have a heart of summer and a heart of winter? Well, the heart. what would be the heart of summer, which would have been the great empire of the dawn in its glory days, is now the heart of shadow, the shadowlands. So basically the other part of the moons of ice and fire theory is that the great empire of the dawn back in the day was camping out next to the heart of summer and that it was a hinge of the world tied to fire and warmth to parallel the heart of winter. But we had a piece of the fire moon fall into the heart of summer and blow it up. And so now it is the heart of shadow. And fire magic is heavily shadowed and corrupted in this story. It's almost like Wheel of Time when the male half of the magic source is corrupted by this one magical act. I do think Martin is using that as the model here. The fire magic is corrupted by the the destruction of the fire moon. Um, but it's not gone. It's on the planet where it shouldn't be. <laughs> so this, I think, is probably why the seasons are screwed up. And that's why winter took dominance right after this disaster and threatens to overwhelm. It's because the ice moon is more powerful. So what's going to happen then is that when the comet returns to cause the new long night and, and hits the other moon, and you'll you'll notice the uh, the legend about the moon says that you know there were, one day there were two moons in the sky one wandered too close to the sun and cracked from the heat the dragons were born one day the other moon will kiss the sun too and crack and the dragons will return the other moon so that's the ice moon one day the ice moon the one associated with the others will crack that's when the comet returns at the end of winds of winter it's going to hit that ice moon. We're going to get new moon meteors and we're going to get a new long night. 
So here's the thing. Ice moons and fire moons do exist in the universe. And the two, the two that Martin is probably thinking of are Io and Europa, which are both very famous moons of Jupiter. Downtown Clowny Brown, don't worry if you're joining late, just pick it up where we go and you can go back and watch. This is just all of my theories from simple to complex. <clears throat> so guys, Io and Europa are very famous moons especially for an old sci-fi author like George. They were two of the first moons to be discovered, and we've known about them for decades. And they are, they are um, named after Greek goddesses, Io and Europa, both of whom are moon goddesses. That's why they named moons after them. It's not, not really cryptic there. Um, So imagine you're George R.R. R. Martin, you're designing a fantasy series, and you're thinking about using a celestial apocalyptic cataclysm as a foundational cause in the story, the long night. We know he's doing this. There was a cataclysm that shaped the world. It was a magical cataclysm. The world we live in is a, is a result of whatever happened then, right? <clears throat> so... Ice and fire. He comes up with this idea for two moons so that you can hit one to cause a long night in the past and, um, you know, hit one to cause a new long night. You need two of them. You need two so you can have ice and fire. So once you're thinking about ice and fire moons, like I said, the most famous fire moon is Io. And Io is basically a floating volcano. It's too close to Jupiter and the gravity of it is putting so much pressure on it that it, it can never cool down. Shout out to locomotive breath who can never slow down. Io can never cool down. It's a flying volcano. It completely changes its entire surface every 50 years or so. The entire thing is churning. It's a ball of magma with volcanoes. That's what it, that's what it is. So it's it's literally a moon made of fire as much as anything can. All the rock on Io is magma rock. So it's black basalt mostly. Um, so then we've got uh, Europa. Europa is an ice moon. And ice moons are basically, they're found all throughout the galaxy, just as fire moons are. And ice moons are basically a rocky moon core that has a global ocean of either liquid methane or very cold water. And then on top of that global ocean, which can be 80 miles thick, they estimate on Europa, then there'll be a crust of ice that'll be again, miles thick. And I apologize if those numbers are wrong. So ice moons are rocky moons covered in liquid oceans and then a crust of ice. And they actually have um, ice volcanoes cryovolcanoes on ice moons, which is basically the water or the liquid methane, which is still very cold, but warmer than the ice. And so it also builds up pressure and erupts through the ice in a geyser of cold water or liquid methane. So just as George has ice dragons and fire dragons, we actually have, um, uh, like I said, ice volcanoes and fire volcanoes. So I think that is where George got the idea for this. Or at least he cobbled that in, Io and Europa. And again, they are um, moon maidens. And then on top of that, I don't have time for this, but the mythology of Io and Europa from Greek mythology is referenced in A Song of Ice and Fire, just so we know that we, he's thinking about Io and Europa. So to me, that ties up pretty well. But that's that's more that's more in the weeds than I can go right now. But that's a fun one. And that is my answer for the seasons. So what's going to happen is when the uh, when the ice moon gets hit, it's not going to be destroyed. It's going to lose its ice crust and it's going to lose its global ocean. And it will be left as a rocky moon. So I think that will strip it of its magic. And that will balance out the situation. So instead of two magical moons of ice and fire, 
we'll just have one rocky moon, which you need, by the way, to keep the planet moored properly. If there's no moons, we flip sideways and everyone dies again. So we can't blow up the second moon. We need something left of it. So it's all it needs to do is puncture that ice crust and blow off all the ice, which means that we'll get very cool icy meteors, um, which will be perfect symbols of the others. And uh, one of those is going to knock down the wall. But I'm getting into the prediction stream. So um, so the last one on this is Night's Queen was an icy Melisandre. This is another one of Durin Durndin. It's entirely his theory. He thought of it. And it's right. It's canon. So behold the Night's Queen art. On the right is Night's Queen by Julia Bohm. A uh, personal, uh, not real life friend, but social media friend who sent me that for the Night's Queen stream. This captures Night's Queen's innocence. Playing in the snow. Exploring ice magic. This is Adara as, as a young lady. Adara from the Ice Dragon story, of course. And then on the left are two by L. Ann. The top one is called uh, The Haunted Forest, and the bottom one is Night's Queen Portrait. So the idea is simple. The idea is that Night's Queen, her name isn't actually Night's Queen. It said Night's King and his corpse queen. It describes her as a woman, eyes like blue stars, pale skin, as pale as the moon, cold as ice. Night's King gave her his seed and soul and they had children or created others or something. So she's called the corpse queen. So I think most people assumed that she's a corpse, like a white, an ice white. But that's weird, because I don't think you can have sex with an ice white. And you certainly can't make others with an ice white, I don't think. It's just weird, because Night's King sounds smitten, right? He chases her and loves her, brings her back and makes her his queen. So other people are like, well, maybe she's a female other. But what is that? All the others are male. So... Dern Durndin, after he read uh, The Ice Dragon, which is the story of a little girl named Adara, he put this together. And he observed the same thing I did about Melisandre, which is that Melisandre is transforming through her use of fire magic. So I guess I should give him an assist on the fire others theory as well. Happily given, Dern Durndin. He observed that Melisandre is transforming in some way with fire magic. And so he said, well, what if somebody did that with ice magic? They'd be an ice priestess. And he noticed that Melisandre takes Stannis' seed and soul and makes black shadows. And this, again, like I said, parallels Night's Queen taking um, Night's King's seed and soul and making white shadows, which are the others. So when you see that parallel, you can say that Night's Queen... She's the key to all this, really. Night's King gives her his seed and soul. She's the one that takes the power and makes the others. She is already transformed in this story. She already has the blue star eye magic. So to me, Night's Queen is the origin of the others. See, when Craster makes his children with his wives, his wives aren't ice sorceresses they're they're women they're normal very downtrodden afflicted women and so their babies come out like normal babies and they're given to the others the others do something uh with the babies to power their existence right duran duran durandon yeah i usually say duran durandon yeah like duran because like duran god's grief and like uh duran from uh, Lord of the Rings, which is where the name comes from. But yeah, you can't think of Duran Duran if you if you want. Yeah, <clears throat> Enclidus uh, is another ice moon. By the way, I'm just looking at the chat there. So, uh, so yeah, Night's Queen, this theory is simply that this is how the others were created. First, you have a woman that transforms through ice magic and becomes a sorceress. She then takes the seed and soul of Night's King, who I think is Azor Ahai, meaning the blood of the dragon person. Just as all the Night's King people parallel, they're either blood of the dragon people 
Or they parallel uh, Azor High. Sorry, one second. Yes, as I was saying, all the Azor High people, like Stannis. Stannis lives on Dragonstone and has Lightbringer. Barrick has Lightbringer. Um, uh, Rhaegar is a Dragon King. Aegon, Dragon King. Um, Damon is another Azor High figure. Jon Snow, Dragon Blood. Daenerys, obviously. So Knights King, I think he was a dragon person. Whatever he was, though. The point is, Knights Queen already has the other magic in her eyes. That's why their children can be others. That's why she can create others, right? So it makes a lot more sense than she's a corpse. If she's a magical woman like Melisandre, like people do think Melisandre is beautiful. Melisandre does get people to fall in love with her and give her their seed and soul. So this would make sense. And again, Stannis and Melisandre parallel knights king and queen in just about every sense. Oh, uh, what's stone? Well, they would have to be sapphires, obviously. Um, Amond one eye has a blue star sapphire eye, and that's uh, that parallels the idea of you know a blue star eye, obviously. Barrick's other wife is a Dane. Barrick's a betrothed to a Dane. I don't. He only has one wife though. Unless you count the weirwoods. I'm going to boil some more water. All right. So that's for that tier. Cool. We're moving into a new tier now. Let me take down these Night's Queen pictures. Oh, no. I've got one more. It's, well, I've sort of touched on it. Night's King and Queen created the others. So this is the whole point of seeing that Night's Queen was an icy Melisandre, is realizing that this is where it all started. So this picture on the right is, uh, it's by Hong Quang, and it's not a Song of Ice and Fire art. I just grabbed it because it kind of looks like Knight's King and Queen at the Night Fort to me. And I like that he's got some tree horns there. So just some groovy art. But again, the whole point of realizing that Knight's Queen is an Ice Priestess is that's how the others are created. That's where the mojo comes from. She makes them directly. So. so there we go. Let's move into the next tier. We're going to descend the iceberg into level five. Oh, what madness is this? I'll give you a second to take in these new theories while I pour my tea. Yes, we've got some we've got some true madness coming here. Also some core LML shit. I would say. We're definitely going square into the the heart of the patch face madness. That's for sure. All right, let me try um let me try that second fire whites video. I actually need to hit the restroom real quick. So, I'm going to try the one that was choppy and uh This actually isn't better. generic salvation or afterlife talk here. A promise of heavenly reward for the loyal soldiers of Azor High. No, I think that when they speak of death itself bending the knee to Azor High, warrior of fire, and of people who fight for him being reborn, 
We should think in very literal terms here. Azor Ahai and his mages may well have actually been warriors of fire, as in walking human torches. And perhaps those who died fighting alongside him were indeed reborn, right there on the spot, just as Beric was. This would mean that Azor Ahai and the magic wielders of his day are in fact the origin of and or the inspiration for the Relorist religion. And that would certainly make a ton of sense, wouldn't it? It would certainly explain why they're so concerned about the second coming of Azor High, a figure whose legend comes from Ashai, which in turn gives us another reason why the Red Priests want to go to Ashai to study. Their religion is founded or heavily influenced by a guy from Ashai. There we go, I think that played a little better. All right, again, please go watch uh, Melisandre Secrets 3 Fire Whites for the full story on that. Yes, here come the bangers. So, let the madness commence. As you can see, we're looking right into Patch Face's crazy face here. So some of these I can go with quickly. I did go pretty deep on some of the ones we've hit so far. I will see. I'll be strategic here. The first one. The green men are Sir Nuno folk. Sir Nuno folk. What do I mean by that? I mean horny boys. Let's zoom out. So on the left, we have Sir Nunos by Ethically Challenged, and on the right, The Keeper by Ha Ma Ha Mai Din. It's a, it's, let's see, it's, it's spelled H A space M Y space D I N H, probably Vietnamese or Thai, something like that. But The Keeper is what it's called. And I've used both of these as cover pieces in the Origin of the Green Men series. which I recommend you watch. It's a three-part series. It's snappy. It's fun and exciting. And it proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that the green men are just what they are supposed to be. So this isn't really even a theory. Like we're told that the green men have antlers and green skin and they ride elk. I'm basically saying that's true. And that's the reason why the legend of Garth the Green is so ubiquitous. This green-skinned man with antlers. He inspired the Order of the Green Hand. And over on, you know, the ancient Storm Kings, they wear an antler crown and dress up like Garth, basically. There was a green king of the God's Eye at one point. So this, all the way up in the, the Wildlings have legends of the Green Men. So this is one of the oldest legends of Westeros. These antlered green men. They obviously would be some sort of cousin to the Children of the Forest perhaps a very closely related race. It's hard to say. Um, there may be some left on the Isle of Faces. We're told that the green men keep watch there. Uh, we, we do not know. They could be human hybrids, green seer hybrids. Um, they could be magical tree people. It could be a few things. Um, and the idea of green as in zombies, uh, as in like corpse, corpse green is there too. Um, because at some uh, the last hero's crew may have been green men or people with green men ancestry and essentially i think that that's where most of the first man skin changer magic comes from is the green men i don't think it all comes from the children of the forest i think some of these ancient first men houses particularly the ones that run towards very large size like the durandans and then the baratheons after them you know, they, they probably have green, some green man blood. Because if humans can have babies with children of the forest, then they can do it with green men too. So the theory is that green men exist and that they look like that, <laughs> basically. And there's a lot of good mythology and folklore that back it up. But what do you guys think? I'm not certain on this. Um, I think it's likely but not for sure. So give me those, some percentages. Do the green men exist on the Isle of Faces? 
We should see them if so, because he said that we're going to go to the Isle of Faces. Oh, thanks, Nadim, with a super chat there. Appreciate that. And I see there's uh, three new PayPals, too. So let me say thank you to some people. From Mod Mary. Thank you, Mod Mary. From Sarah. For our Queen Daenerys. Ah, yes. Long live the Queen. Uh, following up on the specialized dragon idea, what's the most mundane dragon? It would be the road paving dragons. Like I said, you'd want them to be super docile and consistent and able to work with the road crew for hundreds of miles. So it's the road paving dragons that are the most chill. Thanks, friends. So moving on, our next theory is that Nissa Nissa was a child of the forest or a green woman or a hybrid. One of those things. I've got some nice art to show off of this. On the right is Dunmer by Bella Bergholtz. And on the left is Mother of Dragons by Rodora, Rodora Jacob. Mm, ah, mm, tea. So the one on the left is, I think the artist, it's called Mother of Dragons. So it's it's supposed to be Danny. I think it's just Danny reimagined as a fawn creature. But essentially they accidentally drew Nissa Nissa. Because remember, I've said that Nissa Nissa might be the Amethyst Empress. She might have connections to dragons and valerians and dragon blood and all that. <clears throat> but there's even more evidence that Nissa Nissa is a weirwood woman, that she has ties to the weirwoods. She's a child, child of the forest or, like I said, a female of the green man race. It's very, very overwhelming. I did a three-part series on it, which I'm thinking about revisiting for some new videos, by the way. It's called the Weirwood Goddess Series. And it covers most of the female characters in the story. Melisandre, Catelyn, Cersei, Sansa, Ygritte, Asha Greyjoy, all the wildling spearwives, um, all the children of the forest, and uh, Osha the wildling, and a few others. Cersei. They all have Nissa Nissa symbolism, and they all have children of the forest symbolism. So... To me, it seems very, very <laughs> overwhelming that 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 she must be a child of the forest. <clears throat> or like I said, probably a hybrid. And we're gonna, in a minute, we're gonna get to, and I'll probably just combine these. You see at the bottom of this section, it says the Langi old ones were green men. So let's put a pin in the Nissa Nissa thing. I'll come back to that in a second and explain that. But it has to do with these Langi. So on the left, these are the natives of the Isle of Lang. The Isle of Lang is just offshore in the Jade Sea. It's offshore of Yiti and Ashai. It was said to be part of the Great Empire of the Dawn. And the native Langi are super tall. They're like eight feet tall. They have large golden eyes that see well in the dark. They're not said to be slitted like the children of the forest's cat eyes. But they are large and golden like the children of the forest eyes. Their skin is a medium brown which is kind of close to the children, but they're very tall. Okay, now the, the, the ruler of the Lengi is called God Empress. And the rulers of the Great Empire of the Dawn were called the God Emperors. And again, Lang was part of the Great Empire of the Dawn. So potentially a God Emperor of the Great Empire of the Dawn might take a Lengi God Empress as a wife, right? Um, now on Lang... There are these mysterious caves and ruins, and they are said to be the domain of the old ones. And we're not told much about the old ones at all, except for that if you go down there, you might not come back. And that happened to so many people that they had to seal up the ruins in the jungle. But these Langi are freaks. They're too tall and they have golden eyes. So clearly they, they are hybrid 
people. They are people that are bred with some sort of humanoid magical creature that's not quite human. Just like the Cranog men are short and have green eyes often and have green gifts because they interbred with the children of the forest more heavily than other first men. Right? So extrapolation says the Langi must be very tall. The old ones, rather. Okay, back up. The Langi must have interbred with the old ones, and they must have gotten their unusual non-human features, the golden eyes and the eight-foot-tall height, from the old ones, which implies that the old ones must be what? Very tall, and they must have golden eyes. And they live in caves. So they're starting to sound like tall children of the forest. And here's the thing. The phrase old ones is not a random phrase. Of course, that's a well-known Lovecraft phrase. And in Lovecraft, the old ones live on a place called motherfucking Lang. That's right. The old ones are from Lang in Lovecraft world. And here's what they look like. Oh my God, it's green men. They're horny goat boys. They have hairy legs and hooves, and they have big horns, which they sometimes hide under turbans, and big wide mouths that are scary to look at. Very unpleasant, like very grotesque green men. Those are called the men of Lang. I'm sorry, you know what? I'm, I need to correct myself. The men of Lang are not the old ones. The men of Lang worship the old ones. The old ones are gone. They're like incomprehensible beings. But the old ones are gone, and the people who live on Lang worship them. And they are called the men of Lang, and they look like this. That is, now that now we are straight. Lovecraft, Lovecraft aficionados, come at me not. <laughs> Don't come at me, bro. But that's the deal. If you, go to, if you go to Lang, which is sometimes in Antarctica, and sometimes it's in the north, and sometimes it's an island, it changes in different Lovecraft stories, you find these horny people. So... Who are the old ones on Lang? Well, we know they're tall and they have golden eyes. So probably these are the green men. There's more clues about it. A lot more. But that's the theory. And this is how we get Nissa Nissa being a, a hybrid elf creature, potentially. Um, there's two avenues for this. Oh, also, Bloodstone Emperor killed Amethyst Empress and then was said to marry Tiger Woman. Well, the, Lang the Lengi people are associated with tigers. It's called the Land of 10,000 Tigers. <clears throat> so Tiger Woman could be a Lengi god empress, maybe with more old one's blood, so she looks more animal-like with her cat eyes. Because remember, the children of the forest have cat eyes. So that could be Tiger Woman. And Tiger Woman could still be Nissa Nissa. Like, that's, that could be all mixed up. You know what I mean? So... it's also um, pretty strongly implied that the Great Empire of the Dawn was coming to Westeros. So it could be that Bloodstone Emperor came to Westeros and picked up a human child of the forest hybrid Nissa Nissa there and made her his empress. But they've also got a source of those kind of people on Lang. So going back to Nissa Nissa, this stream is so much fun. Are you guys having fun? I love going through all these theories. This is just a blast. So Nissa Nissa, if you look on the right, this is like green sea or Nissa Nissa. She's got red eyes. Those are the children who can have the green gifts. Either have green or red eyes instead of gold. So there's Nissa Nissa, like a red-eyed elf woman, but she's tall. So this is like a green woman, human hybrid Nissa Nissa with red eyes. This could be what she looked like, potentially. Maybe with purple hair or with uh, silver hair, rather. Many possibilities, but... Again, check out the Weirwood Goddess series. It's one of my greatest old podcast works. It's pretty concise. It's not as long and rambly as some of my very first ones. And like I said, I'm thinking about revisiting. Tell me what you think of this, guys. The, the Weirwood Goddess series to make some new videos, kind of like the Melisandre series, where I could do one video about the theory itself and then do a video for each person, one for Catelyn, one for Mel, one for Cersei, one for Ygritte, and show you how they are Nissa Nissa people. Just to give you a teaser, Ygritte, kissed by fire, just like Nissa Nissa was kissed by the fire of Lightbringer. She's she's killed with an arrow through her heart or through her chest. Um, and John didn't do it, but he feels like he did it. 
and then he dreams of killing her with his flaming sword. So Ygritte has tons of Nissa Nissa stuff. Um, however, her name, Ygritte, breaks down to Ig Rite, as in a rite or ritual centered around Ig. And of course, the Weirwoods are Yggdrasil. So it, a woman who's named Ig Rite is basically saying, I'm a Weirwood ritual woman. That's Nissa Nissa. And we see an acting out of that ritual in John's dream. Just when you think I'm talking crazy, I'll always turn it around and completely redeem myself. John's dream of Ygrit and he having sex in the Weirwood Pond. Then she, her flesh melts. She turns into blood and bone. Those words are used exactly. Blood and bone. She melts into the pond in front of the Weirwood tree. We know that the Weirwood tree drinks the blood from that pond. That's where you offer the blood sacrifice to the Weirwood. So Ygritte is melting into the pond, turning into a Weirwood sacrifice, and she's resembling, she's turning into blood and bone. That's the exact description of the Weirwood's white and red coloring. Its bark is bone white. The leaves are like bloody hands. So that is a picture of Nissa Nissa dying and going into the Weirwood net. And again, resembling the weirwood tree even before she does it because she's tied to the weirwood trees. So the whole point of this, Nissa Nissa is a child of the forest, is that Azor High invaded the weirwood net. And that's another one of our theories that we're going to talk about now. Where is this picture? Um, sorry, I'm trying to find this picture to take it down. The man of Lang won't go away. There he is. So you see also on the list, Azor High invaded the Weirwood Net, right? So Azor High, it's no secret that he's seeking after power. He's trying to create a magic talisman, the burning sword. Um, but what he was actually doing, in my opinion, instead of murdering Nissa Nissa uh, to create a flaming sword, was actually, think about her as a child of the forest in front of a Weirwood tree. He's murdering her and using her connection to the Weirwood Tree as a way for him to gain the power of the Weirwood Tree. And a great example of this is the Vermeer Sixskins murder of Thistle. Vermeer Sixskins tries to steal Thistle's body and ends up killing her, and then bounces right from there into the frozen Weirwood Tree. So it's like he's used Thistle's murder to get into the Weirwood Tree. And... He turns Thistle into a weirwood tree, just as Ygritte melts into the pond and turns into blood and bone. Um, Thistle gets what's called the weirwood stigmata. It's a, a, current, a, a, a term that I coined, weirwood stigmata. <clears throat> it's when someone gets wounds that make them look like a weirwood tree. And Thistle's a perfect example. She bites off her tongue. So then she gets a bloody mouth and that makes her mute. And the weirwoods, of course, have a bloody mouth and they don't talk. So it's a mute, bloody mouth. The weirwoods have a carved face. Thistle claws out her eyes. So she's both carving her face and giving herself bloody eyes. And of course, the weirwoods also have bloody eyes. <clears throat> so you've got this basically Veramir murdering this woman, turning her into a weirwood figure, and then going into the weirwood tree. So that is part of the symbolic sort of acting out of that sequence. But the whole, the big theory here is that Azor Ahai chose Nissa Nissa and murdered her so that he could gain entrance to the Weirwood Net. And that is why we see all the Azor Ahai people invading the woods. The defining feature of all the Azor High people is that they're questing after fire of the gods and they're willing to sacrifice people to, to get power. And we see that echo in all the stories. And the Weirwood Net is ultimately the power that I think he was going after. So the first place that I got onto this idea is from Lord Beric Dondarrion. He's the first person we see with a real magic flaming sword. And he lives in a weirwood cave. So that just kind of has to make you wonder, like why 
why would they um oh yeah the men of lang also thank you desmond they uh they kind of live on the moon or they go back and forth to the moon um they serve these things called the moon beasts and they command the galleys that fly through space um which is also like the weirwood ship metaphor and all the connections and the weirwood and the moon so there is more to that again check out the origin of the secret origin of the green men isle of lang video for all that good 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 stuff that's okay desmond i appreciate it <clears throat> so when you see Beric Tondarian sitting in a weirwood cave with a flaming sword and you're on to this idea of archetypes, which is its own theory, but just the idea that Martin is creating people that parallel Azor Ahai and Nissa Nissa and all those other figures, Knight's King. And you can see, obviously, this is an Azor Ahai parallel person. He's got a flaming sword and he's running on fire magic, so that's good. But he lives in a weirwood cave. So did Azor Ahai live in a weirwood cave? The next weirwood we cave we see is Blood Raven's cave. And oh, Blood Raven is a blood of the dragon person. So why do we have this dragon person living in a cave? And even before George created the character of Blood Raven, he said he knew that Green Seer was going to be a dragon person, a Targaryen. It's very important that the Green Seer is a Targaryen. It's showing us a picture of a dragon person invading the weirwood net. And Beric is showing us Azor Ahai living inside of it. And then there's Jon Snow. Jon Snow has a wolf that looks like a weirwood. And by the way, um, that Beric picture was by Jonathan Burton. And this one here at White Tree is by Richard Hescox. <clears throat> so as you can see from this picture, Ghost the Wolf looks exactly like the weirwood bone white fur blood red eyes john even notices it. he's like oh it looks just like the weirwood it's from the old gods now where's john going when he dies inside his wolf so where did azor high go when he died he went inside the weirwood tree that's where he went that's why the weirwood face looks all tortured it's been invaded by azor high so is, uh, there's um, there's a lot to this. Uh, it's a huge theory. You really have to start with Weirwood Compendium 1, which has all the Grey King Greenseer stuff. And it begins to show you why this is true. But I'm 100%, 1,000% sure that Nissa Nissa was a child of the forest and that, Nissa, and that Azor killed her to invade the Weirwood net. I'm as, I'm as sure of that as I am of anything. Um, so I'm going to let you look at this for a second. I need to, uh, I need 30 seconds. One second. I guess it's silly to say 30 seconds and then one second, but that's how expressions are. We divorce them from their literal meaning. I had to let Goose out a little bit. 
he can't come out here, obviously, but um, yeah, bird things. Okay, so again, John going into his wolf is going to be a parallel for Azor Ahai going into the weirbed net. And yeah, Barrack, John, Blood Raven, those are all good clues about it. Uh, and even the idea of Stannis being an Azor Ahai figure who's also a Baratheon, which makes him a horned lord. Um, the whole point of making him a horn lord is to make him a parallel to a green man. So Stannis is kind of like a green man, Azor High figure. Same as for Renly's ghost. When Garland Tyrell dresses up in Renly's armor, golden golden horns and uh, the flames of, of the battle reflect on his armor and his horns. So it looks like he has flaming horns and ghostly green armor. So this is a fiery undead green man figure. <clears throat> That's one way to see Azor high, And the whole point of the green man symbolism is to show you that he is inside the weirwood tree. Because that's how you get antlers. Like, the antlers of the stag man are supposed to represent the branches of the tree. It's a pretty obvious symbolic parallel. So a person with antlers, that's why Cernunos is a guardian of the forest, right? He's associated with trees. Hearn the Hunter and several versions of Cernunos are specifically tied to certain trees. So anybody that has antler symbolism in a song of ice and fire we should see that as green seer symbolism certainly that's true for robert who's a parallel to garth green so that's the azor high theory and the lengi theory and the nissa nissa theory uh so let's talk about under the green sea that's kind of related so this is simple and also deep like the ocean itself and it's the simple idea that the phrase under the sea is being used as a metaphor to describe things that are happening inside the weirwood net, which is like a green sea that the green seers swim in. Yeah, <clears throat> so it's a word pun. A word pun. The green seers swim under the sea, uh, but it's it, it's a lot more than that, though. Uh so here is a picture of a weirwood tree by Michael, I'm sorry, Michelle Montini. Here is a picture of Patchface. Everything that Patchface talks about, under the sea, this and that, under the sea, this and that, that's all stuff that's happening in the weirwood net, and it's talking about the others in the Night's Watch. You can check out one of my Patchface streams where I talk about, basically decode all of his riddles as referring to the Green Sea. Now, this all has to do with the word weir. It's not just the green sea or pun. It's, it's the word weir in weirwood tree. A weir is a wooden structure that spans across a body of water that regulates the flow of water and catches fish. That's what it does. It's kind of like a dam or a bridge. And sometimes a weir is also a bridge. <clears throat> so you can slow down the flow of the water and it's got wooden fencing lattice work that catches the fish and then you just walk up and pull the fish out and it's does the fishing for you can be called a fishing weir can also be called a fish garth so that we have garth the green that plants weirwoods <laughs> so there's a whole there's a whole symbolism thing going on here so think about when blood raven says the weirwoods stand astride the river of time but they're not moved by it so that depicts the weirwood is spanning a moving river. The river is moving past the weirwood. The weirwood is not moved by the river. So literally that, that description describes the weirwood just like a fishing weir. It, 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 the river flows by it, but it is not moved by the river. <clears throat> then we, I, I told you that the fish get caught up in the wooden latticework of the river, right? Well, they look just like green seers in the roots of the weirwoods. The green seers are literally caught in the roots, in the wooden lattice work, just like a fish in a weir. And they're also being metaphorically scooped out of the river of time because they're being given access to the entire river of time and they're given a kind of immortality inside the weirwood net. So the green seers are the fish and the weirwood net is the weir. And the weir is kind of, the weirwood trees are kind of trapping the green seers, both physically and magically in order to bestow their magic. So 
there is a whole bunch of aquatic symbolism with the weirwoods, both with the under the sea stuff and with the weir symbolism. And it goes all kinds of places. Check out the weirwood compendium from episode six to episode 10. I introduced the green sea symbolism in six and use it all through the next five episodes. <clears throat> now this theory, you see it on the far left. That means it is not my theory. Azor High and V to the Weirwood Net is my theory. Nissa Nissa is a, is a child of the forest. Absolutely my theory. I came up with that. Don't believe anyone else who says they did. That's mine. And uh, the Grey King is a green seer, which I'm about to say about. That one's mine too. Um, under the green sea is Ravenous Reader. The great Ravenous Reader. It's, it's the brilliant thing that she figured out. One of the most brilliant insights of anybody analyzing a song of ice and fires figuring this out because once you figure out the green sea thing then everything about the squishers and the ironborn and drowning people and ponds and black water and all of it opens up the boats the ships all the aquatic symbolism is talking about the weirwood net so it makes all of that stuff way interesting house of valerion with the seahorse they have the blood of the dragon but they have a seahorse and like, there's just so much. That's why I did five episodes with the weird compendium on the green sea stuff. So it's the green dragon contributes to that because it's a green dragon. So if Azor high is a dragon that invades the green sea, the green dragon is going to be a great vehicle to show us about a green sea or dragon. And that is what Regal does. It's all Regal does is show us green sea or dragon symbolism over and over. <clears throat> That's why Rhaegar died at the green fork of the trident. <clears throat> so Rhaegar literally bled out into the green sea. And the trident, of course, is a weapon of a sea god. But it's the green fork is the point. Um, and also Danny thinks about the green banks of the trident is where her brother died. That's why she names green Rhaegal after Rhaegar. because he died on the green banks of the trident. So Rhaegar's blood and rubies which are like fiery meteors or whatever, but it's blood mainly pouring out into the green sea as he dies. That's Azor Rahai going into the weirwood net. So there you go. Thank you, Ravenous Reader, for that great theory. Um, Moat Kalen is like Yeen. Oh, I love this. This is great. This is short and sweet. So Yeen, I'm actually just going to pull up the quote here. It's important to get the words. It's basically, Yeen is made out of oily black stone and huge square black blocks. And this art is by Enrique Merguia. And Mo Kalen is also made out of huge black square stone blocks. And in one scene, they're coated with a fine black oil. So it might be oily stone, even though it's also basalt. Um, so let's see. <clears throat> Maesters and other scholars alike have puzzled over the greatest of the enigmas of Sothorios, the ancient city of Yin, a ruin older than time built of oily black stone, in massive blocks so heavy it would require a dozen elephants to move them. Yin has remained a desolation for many thousands of years, yet the jungle that surrounds it on every side has scarce touched it. A city so evil even the jungle will not enter, Nemeria is supposed to have said, when she laid eyes on it, if the tales are true. <clears throat> so the main thing is the blocks. Uh, 12, it needs a dozen elephants, right? So a dozen elephants, that's huge, huge black blocks. Mo Kalen's uh, blocks are as big as a cottage, and they're also square and black. So basically the same size. Let's see here. It's also in a jungle, too, so it's kind of similar. Um, I'm not going to make you guys wait while I look for this. 
but they are they are compared to the size of a cottage and it said it must have taken like 40 men to move them or something um the thing about mo Kalin is that the curtain walls at mo Kalin, and let me put you uh, the mo Kalin art up here this is from renee agner um actually that one doesn't show it as well let me try this one so the curtain walls here these are a little taller. They're described as uh, as tall as Winterfell's, which means 80 feet. So here you can see the size of the blocks in the swamp is very accurate here. This is Douglas Wheatley, or Ted Nasmith, sorry, Ted Nasmith. And these, so you see the huge blocks. They're almost cottage size. Should be a little bigger. But imagine, these are megaliths. Um, and they're stacked up 80 feet tall. It had a curtain wall. Mo Kalen had 20 towers. It's a gargantuan construction, and it's completely unlike anything else the first men did. It matches nothing in Westeros or anywhere else except for Yin. It's almost the same as Yin. Big square black blocks, cottage size, stacked up tall, in a jungle, and although Mo Kalen is not said to be haunted, I mean, it actually is said to be haunted, <laughs> Um, it's not as haunted as Yin, but no one lives there. No one's lived there for a long damn time. And, uh, the swamps are full of poisonous things all around. So really it's pretty comparable to Yin. And what we're left with is that something bad happened to Moat Kalen. It's obviously been knocked, knocked out. You know, most of its towers are down. The walls are down. So massive earthquakes happened here. Uh, and it's in a swamp and normally you don't build castles in a swamp. It's hard. It's inconvenient and it's hard. Um, so no one does it really. It's just a bad idea. Uh, and so yet yeah, this castle is in a swamp. So most likely the neck was flooded. Um, that, and we're told that, that the neck might be connected to the hammer of the waters. The hammer of the waters legends are confused. Sometimes it sounds like there's two. Sometimes it sounds like there's just different ideas about where it was called down, either from Moat Kalen or the Isle of Faces. But the point is that this place got flooded out. Moat Kalin flooded out. Blackstone flooded out. Iron Islands flooded out. Arm of Dorn flooded out. I think this all happened at the same time. That's the point. Not Migos raps. The point is all this flooding happened at the same time. These were moon meteors. There are probably multiple meteors that struck. We're not going to talk about the Iron Islands too much, but same story there. There's a castle that nobody knows who built it. And it's built on a collapsed part of the island. So obviously the collapse happened after the castle was built. So you have these mysterious mysterious castle at Pike. And they have an oily black stone sea stone, sea stone chair. Also mysterious. We don't know where it was from. The first Ironborn found it. And then we have this place, Moat Kalen, that matches Yin and might be oily black stone. And it's on the same parallel as the Iron Islands. And if you go across from the Iron Islands to Moat Kalen and keep going, you end up on the Three Sisters where they have lots of legends of squishers and people with webbed fingers. So you can see that there might have been a squisher presence across the waste of Westeros from the Iron Islands to the Neck to the Sisters and Cracklaw Point as well. Also more squisher legends. We know that those are on Cracklaw Point. And please don't let me get the nimble dick voice out. It hurts too much. Please. Consult the Brienne. <laughs> nimble Consult the Brienne stream. I'm not going to do the voice. I'm not going to do the voice. I'm not going to do the voice. Okay. So, Squishers Legends across the waste of Westeros. Oily black stone at the Iron Islands. Moat Kalen might be oily stone. You see, you see the picture here. There might have been a Squisher or human squisher hybrid civilization that existed before the long night, maybe like way before the long night. But I promise you this first men did not build Moat Kalen. Not, it doesn't look like any of the ring forts doesn't look like any of their castles. It's weird as fuck. And it might, again, it might match Yin. So there, this is, this is what you get level, level five of the iceberg under the sea here. <laughs> Moat Kalen is like Yin. So that, that covers, oh, others are exiled hive mind. We're almost done with level five. I'm getting excited. 
So the others are an exiled hive mind. Um, I don't have to talk about this too much because I just did two, three hour live streams about this. But the idea is that originally the dead green men or children of the forest spirits would inhabit the weirwoods as their afterlife. When Azor Ahai invaded the weirwoods, he hollowed out the trees and pushed out their intelligence. And that weirwood net hive mind then became the others. It got exiled. And that's why the others are of the wood, like we talked about earlier. That's why they are like walking trees. That's why they defend the wood. White walkers of the wood, giving the Craster gives his sons to the wood, which means giving them to the others. They're avatars of the wood because they were exiled from their tree home. That is what Azor Ahai did. That is part of his great sin, creating the others as he exiled them from the weirwoods. And so the others are a hive mind. They are all identical. Twins to the first. Same, they look the same. That's because they are a merged hive mind of dead green men. So they're like, they're like dead green men. And they're like ice warriors. And that's the others. So again, check out creation of the others and exile of the others, as well as we're walkers for that theory. But that's the gist of it. And this art is on the right. It is, um, Waymar by Topo83, and on the left, it is The Death of Waymar Royce by Jonathan Burton. And this one on the right, I really love, because it's got the mirror-like other, and it's walking towards, it's actually not canon. Will didn't climb a weirwood tree, but I kind of like the choice to make it a weirwood here. And I like that you can see Will and Waymar at the same time. Very cool angle. To the dangle. Here we are. We are in our, we have passed three hours. We're in hour four of the LML Iceberg stream. How many do we have watching? 360. Thank you, people. Wonderful, wonderful audience. Let us go deeper. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What is this madness? Feast your eyes on that. So, the first two theories are about what is in the heart of winter. And I have two, guess two guesses. One is a frozen weirwood tree. And the other is an oily black stone. So, talking about the frozen weirwood tree first. I will show you this art. It is called Frozen Weirwood Tree by Bo Zonavade. Let me zoom out so you can see all of it. There she is. And the wood is turned dark too. I like this. So it's very simple. There is a running theme of corrupt weirwood trees and frozen weirwood trees. Like I just talked about, Vermeer Six Skins. After he kills Thistle, he goes into a weirwood tree that's called a pale shadow armored in ice. Pale shadow of a weirwood armored in ice. Now, obviously, the others are called pale shadows and white shadows, and they wear ice armor. So this weirwood tree is dressed up like another. And there's a couple others, too. The one on the, uh, on the island near the Crofter's Village, where Stannis is. That one's frozen over, too. It looks like snow. And so, uh, yeah, the others, like I said, they've been exiled from the weirwood trees. But sometimes it looks like the weirwood trees have been bifurcated and maybe they're caught in a frozen side of the weirwood net, frozen side of the green sea. And we also go to the House of the Undying and find these parallel for the others. They're cold blue shadows and they're gathered around a blue shadow heart. So this seems like an obvious symbolic parallel to the idea of the heart of winter and the others. And outside they have inverted weirwood trees, right? The shade of the evening trees with black bark and blue leaves. So it's like a weirwood tree flipped over. So it just tells you the weirwoods, the others are tied to the weirwoods too, but their side of the weirwood is like inverted or shadowed or corrupted or something. So 
makes sense to me that in the heart of winter, we should see weirwood something. And it should definitely be a frozen weirwood if it's in the heart of winter. And it might even be black, like a shade of the evening tree, or it could even be an actual shade of the evening tree. That is one guess. My other guess for the heart of winter, and these are not exclusive. Is this pretty much what we saw on the show. And remember, this is the weirwood tree where Night King is created. It later turns into a frozen, black, dead weirwood tree. And around it are these black obelisks. Now, I think the show probably just threw those in there to look cool and creepy and old, which makes sense. However, there's a small part of me that wonders if maybe, just maybe, George Martin mentioned something about oily black stone in the heart of winter. Because oily black stone is in the heart of a shy, in the heart of shadow, and it seems to be corrupt. So perhaps there's an oily stone in the heart of winter it would actually be parallel to Azor High the dragon invading the weirwood net. Because the black meteors are like dragons, so it would have invaded the heart of winter. Also, the idea of Azor High as a dragon who gives his seed and soul to Night's Queen, who then uses it to make the others, which makes the others like frozen dragons. That would be parallel if there's a black meteor in the heart of winter, somehow magically providing its mojo to the others. This could be why the whites rise. Because we don't, in the show, the, the Night King raises the dead, but we never see that in the books. In the books, we don't know. But everybody seems to rise. Everybody that dies north of the wall seems to rise as an ice white. Whether or not there are... And yes, I saw your PayPal, Parker. Thank you. Um, I do love them. Um, there, It could be uh, that all the whites are rising because there's an oily black stone. Because Stygi is called the Corpse City. And we see that in the Shadowlands... It's very hard on the living. Animals and children can't handle it. So it's kind of like the heart of winter where you have to be a magically transformed person to withstand the toxic magic. So it could be that in the heart of winter, we will find one or both of oily black stone and frozen weirwood. So says I. We should start back. This one belongs to Wiz the Smith. And he discovered that there are some chapters that appear to be written in mirror image, such as the Waymar prologue, where you can read it up to the middle <clears throat> and it hits this reflex point and then echoes the same pattern in reverse to the end of the chapter, which gives the chapter a mirror-like structure. And, and because of that, you can actually start at the end and read it back to the beginning. And we did that with the prologue and it turned out a lot of really cool stuff that lined up with some of the theories that we've been talking about today, in fact such as the others needing to go back into the weirwood net <clears throat> because they were kicked out. So check out the video. This is the, the title for the video. We should start back. And uh, that's a humdinger. That's a real humdinger. That's some next level shit. And you, your, your jaw might be on the floor. Um, that's a team effort too. Ravenous Reader, Wiz the Smith, Rusted Revolver, a couple other people chipped in. So that's some next level shit. If, it um it's it goes back to James Joyce and his his um his famous and very confusing work. Uh, somebody help me out, James Joyce. Um, it's almost unreadable. It's so crazy, uh, and it's all time disfigured. The the last chap the last sentence of the book is a fragment that connects with the beginning sentence, so that the book is meant to be read in a loop, and uh, it's. No, it's not Ulysses. Finnegan's Wake. It's Finnegan's Wake. That's it. <clears throat> so this might be a lit nerd thing where George is referencing Finnegan's Wake. Um, because the first so the first sentence of the prologue is we should start back. That's the first sentence. So this set off the light bulb. It's like we should start back. What do you mean? We should go backwards at the beginning. So it's like, it, it, there's this idea like, oh, well, maybe it should be read backwards. Maybe we should start by reading it backwards. So we did that and it made too much sense. So 
it sounds like kind of like madness, but check out the We Should Start Back episode and see what you think. Make up your mind for yourself. That's definitely a fun one. And it's definitely way down deep under the sea. <laughs> Very advanced mythical astronomy. Oh my God, it's Dracomorph theory. Dracomorph. And this one is on the left because it's somewhat, um, it's somewhat, it could be, uh, it, it could be like, um, what am I trying to say? Sorry, I lost my train of thought. This is this idea of, is building on the back of somebody else's theory. Uh, so Amanda Crowfood's daughter from the YouTube channel called The Disputed Lands has the secret origin of the blood of the dragon or the secret origin of the Valerians. I forget what it's called. It's a two-part series about the blood of the dragon. It's some of the greatest Song of Ice and Fire analysis that I've ever seen. Two of my favorite videos. And I think it's all 100% correct. And uh, it's too long to go into, but it, it basically explains the specifics of the blood magic experiments that created the blood of the dragon. And I expanded on it and came up with this terrifying thing based on Aurea and her fireworms. So Dracomorph is referencing Xenomorph, like aliens, the movie Aliens. And the alien Xenomorphs reproduce, of course, in a very disgusting way. They have the eggs, the eggs hatch, and then the face, the whole oh, the face huggers. Oh my god, the face huggers. The face huggers leap out very fast and skittery, and they jump on your face and they imp, they imp, they 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 mouth fuck you and, and put an alien egg in your in your body that ages really quickly, and then the chest burster hatches out of your chest and turns into the alien. And it's uh it's uh it's a perversion of every sexual idea that exists it's so gross anyways oh uh so the idea is that think about Araya's fireworms okay Araya is that targaryen girl who's like nine or ten she hops on the back of Valeria on the black dread and accidentally flies to valeria because she doesn't know how to control where he goes she comes back with these horrible parasites she's burning up and things are moving inside of her and they put her in a bath of ice water and all these little worms break out of her. And her skin is blackening and crisping like pork crackling. And she's basically just burning up, just roasting from the inside because of these parasitic worms. And when they come out, they have human faces and human hands and worm bodies. And they're creatures of fire. We know this because they die in the ice water. But they also have, they have done something. They have apparently, I think, have merged with her DNA. They have done a Dracomorph thing. Because the thing about the aliens is those face huggers, when they inject the egg into the host, it combines with the DNA of the host to make the alien. So when the face huggers in subsequent alien movies impregnate different kinds of creatures, we get different kinds of aliens. That is the horrible thing about the, the it turns out to be the black goo from Prometheus, but that's going down a whole rabbit hole. So <clears throat> the idea is that these worms that come from Valeria show the ability to combine their worm DNA with that of their human host and produce a hybrid offspring. Um, oh, it didn't have hands? I thought it had hands. It definitely has a human face. I thought it had hands. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, so it is also a shout out to Dune, obviously the worm god emperor. But the point is, these worms show the ability to combine the worm DNA with the human DNA. And we get this hybrid of the worm with the human face. So if you kept trying long enough, torturing enough people, you might be able to create a human hybrid offspring that is more stable. And this happens in aliens, actually. Eventually, Ripley gets only like a little bit of alien queen DNA in her, and they clone her and stuff. And she's basically looks human, but has super abilities because of her trace alien DNA. And the aliens recognize Ripley and don't hurt her anymore. She's like the queen. So it could be 
that through enough experimentation with these parasitic worms, you can combine human and dragon DNA or fireworm and dragon DNA. And that this is how the blood of the dragon was created. Because there has to be a way to get the reptilian DNA into House Targaryen. And these, these worms are showing us that it can be done. So definitely check out the Disputed Lands and her videos about the blood of the dragon. And I've got a video called Dracomorph on my channel, which you can check out. And that will explain it. It's definitely a horrifying theory. Uh, okay, so I'm going to cheat a little bit here. One of the next ones we've got is OG Lightbringer made from the Bloodstone Emperor's Black Stone. So this is the theory that the Black Meteor that the Bloodstone Emperor worshipped was used to make Lightbringer. And Lightbringer is actually the first Valyrian steel, the first black sword. And you go, oh, but what about Dawn? Dawn is Lightbringer too. Well, there are clues that maybe there are two Lightbringers, a white one and a black one, with Dawn being the white one and some mysterious sword being Azor High's black sword. Because, of course, Dawn is made from a pale meteorite. And then Bloodstone Emperor, who might be Azor High, he worships a black meteor. So maybe he makes a black sword from the black meteor <clears throat> in basically a fallen version of the uh, Great Empire of the Dawn tradition. Because like I said, Dawn might come from there. So let me put up some artwork and check PayPal real quick. Where is the art for this one? I think I put the art in the wrong place for this. I know I have it. Yeah. That's what I did. Oh, no, this is for later. I know what I did. Okay, so to explain this a little better, instead of art, I will show you several arts. I will show you a preview or a teaser from the Nightbringer series. So if you've seen the Nightbringer series, forgive me for repeating myself, if you will. But this, this is the very succinct case for why I think there might be two Lightbringer swords. And there's a lot of good reasons why. So check this out. The names Eldric Shadow Chaser and Hercoon the Hero are very clear nods to Michael Moorcock's Elric of Melnibene book series, which Martin has credited as being a large influence on his own writing. Elric of Melnibene is a dragon-riding hero, or perhaps anti-hero, with a black, blood-drinking, magically flaming dragon sword called Stormbringer. Stop me when any of this sounds familiar. Elric is also an emaciated, nihilistic, white-haired albino sorcerer who's kept alive by psychedelic drugs and magic. And yeah, this should remind you of Blood Raven. And of course, it turns out that Blood Raven and Elric both draw influence from the Norse god Odin, as I documented in Odin Origins Blood Raven, which you should definitely watch. Elric of Melnibene also has a sinister cousin, Ir Kun, who contests against Elric with a matching black dragon sword called Mornblade. That's right, Sword of the Morning. Mornblade, you're catching on. And this is why another of Azor High's names is Hercoon the Hero. Then, to tie all this back to House Dane and Westeros, George left a couple of Eldric name variants in the family tree of House Dane. There's Edric Dane, who appears in the main story as the squire of Beric, don't call me Azor High Dondarian, and also Ulric Dane, a sword of the morning from the time of Daemon Black. Fire. Eldric Shadow Chaser, in other words, could be the Westerosi name for Azor Ahai and or the last hero, if those are the same people or related people. And the last hero is, of course, remembered as having chased the white shadows away. Shadow Chaser. Chasing oh, the white oh, shadows. Oh, oh, choke, choke. It's choking. 
Commander, come in. Yeah, sorry. Um, well, okay, so I don't know why that's not working, but I don't want to crash the stream again. So let me just say that the point of all that is uh, that in the Elric of Melnibene world, Elric uh, has a black sword called Stormbringer, like I said. So obviously this is similar to Lightbringer um, and black Valerian steel swords. Elric is a dragon lord. Melnibene is a dragon lord civilization. Tons of parallels to Valeria. It's a huge influence on A Song of Ice and Fire. Now, Elric has Stormbringer. Stormbringer has a twin sword called Mornblade, as I was saying. And uh, uh, Mornblade is... Um, uh, oh, for those of you who did not notice the shirt change, I did this a minute ago. This is... Uh, we're going deep underwater, so I've got my squisher Let's Go Fishing shirt on. Um, that's what's going on. So Elric and his cousin find Stormbringer and Mornblade at the same time. And if you look at my stream, uh, Curse of the Black Swords, I, I read this whole passage from Elric. They find these two swords at the same time, and then they have a duel with them. Um, so the idea that there are two Lightbringer swords, if, if there's not, it's like George doing a twist. Because the sword that Lightbringer is the most similar to is definitely Stormbringer, and Stormbringer has a twin sword. Now, Elric's cousin that has the, has the other sword, Mornblade, his name is Irkun. And then George told us that two of the other names for um, Azor High are Elric and Hirkun. Irkun, Hirkun. So he's telling you that, like, either there were multiple Azor Highs or there's just different names for Azor High, but two of those names are the names of these two rival cousins with two different swords. So they're absolutely, with such a strong reference to Elric and Hirkun, there very well could be two Lightbringers. And if so, Dawn is one, and the other one is going to be a black sword made from the Bloodstone Emperor's Black Meteor. <clears throat> so that's the theory. And uh, it also ties into Lord of the Rings. There's this guy named Eol, the Dark Elf, who makes two swords, two black swords from a meteor. They're called Anguirel and Anglicel. One of them gets turned into Girthang. that's used by Turin, whose nickname is Turin Blacksword, after the sword. And I went into all this in the Nightbringer series and the Curse of the Black Swords live stream, so check it out there. But basically, uh, <clears throat> twin meteor swords are a thing in Tolkien too. And they're cursed, and they're involved in a lot of tragic killings that sound a lot like Azor Ahai and Nissa, Nissa both with Turin and Eol. Uh, so... Yeah, there's lots of cool stuff there. Lots of cool Tolkien, deep Silmarillion parallels. If you're wondering if George has read the Silmarillion, the answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. So <clears throat> the last one. Oops, did I reveal this too soon? I did. I totally didn't mean to show you those other ones on the right that you didn't see. Those I didn't say anything about a seventh tier. There's no seventh tier. These are the most crazy theories. Dracomorph theory. And the last one, weirwoods contain meteor poison. I've already explained this, basically. Um, the idea is that the meteors are what's poisoning a shy and causing the shadow. So if a meteor landed in Westeros, why doesn't Westeros look like a shy? Well, the answer might be the weirwoods. Because the weirwoods um, have a lot of grave worm symbolism. Their roots are like grave worms, and grave worms eat corruption. They eat the corruption of cor corpses buried underground. Uh, and the idea of, again, remember I said the dragon inside the weirwood net, the dragon characters are parallel to meteors. So when you see Blood Raven, the dragon, sitting in the weirwood roots, it's almost like there's a, a meteor down there in the roots. Um, and you also see in a brand vision, his tree grows from a stone. Uh, there's... Probably too much scattered stuff for me to, to totally explain it, with like all the symbolic clues about it. But essentially, the idea is that the Weirwoods might be able to, they might be protecting Westeros, essentially. They might be um, containing the poisonous magic. Maybe there's a meteor on the Isle of Faces, but it's surrounded by Weirwoods, and that's containing the toxic magic. It's mostly symbolic clues that point to this. I'm not at all certain by any means. 
Uh, but it is one of the deeper tin foils that I have. So that being said, I sort of accidentally revealed this too soon. I wanted to be all dramatic about it, but oh my God, it's another level of theories on the right. These are is even crazier theories. They're on the other side of the iceberg. So Winterfell, Crips, Weird with Thrones. Let me back out here. So um, let me go in order. Oh my God, it's Bernard Stark. Bernard Stark, King of Winter. Yes. Yes, I'm a man of the people. Okay, I'm not going to do that. Um, here, There's your Bernie cameo. I did put Bernie in the promo picture, so you knew you had to get a Bernie cameo. Check out the Weird Walkers video where I went way too long with the Bernie Stark humor. Um, <laughs> he's got the mittens because it's cold down there in the crypts. So yeah, if you want more Bernie Stark humor, that's that's in the Weird Walkers video, which hopefully you've watched anyway. But uh, let me take Bernie off here, and we'll talk seriously about the Crips for a second. I'm so lost. Where is it? There it is. This one is by oh, so this is Michael Comark right here. By the way, the without Bernie, it was Michael Comark. I, I put Bernie in there. Um, it is also one of my finest photoshops. I made him look like a statue, kind of. Give some props. Uh, this one is uh, Winter is Here by Fran Vegas. It's an excellent Crips picture. So this theory is that there is Weird with Throne down in the lowest levels of the Crips. That's what the secret is. There's some big secret down there. Lowest levels are collapsed. John's Dream goes down there. It always stops. What's down there? Rhaegar's Harp. You know, it could be, okay. So it could be Azor High's Black Lightbringer sword, eight thousand year olds. That could be down there. Um, more likely, Weirwood Thrones are down there. Perhaps the first few Stark kings um, would be sitting on like stone statue Weirwood Thrones. But I would, I don't wonder if the original Stark kings would have gone down to the lowest levels to be retired Green Seers, just like those old children of the forest in Blood Raven's cave that are like basically gone and they're just sort of moving their mouths. And they've been absorbed into the weirwood net, but their bodies are just being feed, uh, fed. Um, uh, the roots are feeding off of their bodies, you know? Well, in the lowest level of the crypts, you might find stark skeletons strung up in weirwood thrones. That's what I think. And potentially that could tie into the idea that some of them are going to rise or something like that. But I think the reveal will be that they're green seer kings. There could be a weirwood throne down there for Bran to sit on, too. That's kind of the point. And before I forget, because I've I've tried to do this several times and then forgotten, uh, more PayPal's have come in, and I'd like to say thank you. Nicholas says, which of my theories is my favorite? Either because it has the best symbolism or just because it's the most fun. Um, well, Moon Meteor's theory is right up there, obviously. It's the easy answer. I'm really attached to Great Empire of the Dawn and Green Zombies. Those are like my original theories. Um, Jojen Paste was the most fun I ever had making a video. Uh, weirwood paste is people is what that one's called and that's definitely the most fun i've ever had that's all my best jokes are in there um also the anr targaryen faceless man doom video was a ton of fun a lot of good jokes in that one or at least good jokes for my humor um i'm not saying i'm overly funny i'm just saying i felt funny so uh and not in a bad way funny haha -ha. so thank you nick Oh, twist on Jojen paste. What if the paste is one of those children of the forest? What if they carved up one of those old children of the forest, retired green seers, and Jojen is alive? And George faked us out by having him disappear and then feeding Bran the paste. And we're right that it's not weirwood seeds because weirwood seeds don't exist because weirwoods are, like I said, mushroom organisms where they live underground and then pop up the trees up top. What if the paste is of one of those children? And Jojen's not dead. So I would accept that as acceptable. I, I do not accept that it is just seed paste. It's either Jojen or one of those children. <clears throat> so yeah, Winterfell Crips. Um, oh, uh, PayPal's. That's right. What is my second favorite fantasy series besides The Song of Ice and Fire? No Tolkien. And that is Parker Tobia. Hmm. <laughs> well... The ones I read when I was a young man were formative, but they're not, they don't quite hold up. Like the, you know, some of the, the second 
wave of Shannara books, the Elfstones of Shannara, and uh, a couple of those other ones are really cool. Uh, really like some of the early Raymond Feist stuff. I mentioned Feist on the stream the other day. Not a lot of people talk about him, but his star elves and magic portals and shit were just awesome. And pug is awesome. And, uh, his stuff got a little repetitive as time went on as did, uh, Terry Brooks, but Raymond Feist is an OG and, uh, really liked, uh, lies of Locke Lamora. I uh, like how it operated on two different timelines at the same time. You got to see chapters interspersed of somebody as a kid and as a grown up, And I really like that. I plan on using that, uh, but with multiple character POVs. That's right. Not only do multiple POVs when I write fake Atlantis fiction, I will have time, different times, different chapters from different times because I'm too inspired by the show Dark. And I will tell you again, watch Dark on Netflix in the original German with subtitles. And they're doing time jumps so they can show you how events in different times relate to each other. Um, they're doing actual time travel. But I think without time travel, you could use it as a writing device. Imagine Winds of Winter opens and one of the chapters says Rhaegar. And now you're reading about the lead up to the Tower of Joy. And that's how George would reveal the Tower of Joy, just by dropping a fucking Rhaegar chapter in Winds of Winter. That would be sick, right? So I plan on doing something like that when I write. What were we talking about? Thank you, Parker. That was a good question. Uh, Natasha with a generous thank you, PayPal. Thank you, Natasha. Jason, sender of tea water boilers and uh tea uh loose leaf tea dipper thingies um great stream keep up the work hope you like the tea i haven't gotten to use it yet but i will do you think alice rivers has anyone anything to do with a current story parker asks um alice rivers was a very interesting place to stop fire and blood um i really wish oh thank you donnell peoples yeah you should start back from the beginning exactly this will be a great one to rewatch because it's basically, like I said, all my theories and all the theories that I like to talk about. Um, Alice Rivers is an interesting sorceress that hangs out with Amond One Eye at Heron Hall right before the duel with Damon. And she apparently can see the future and see visions in the fire, but also in a puddle or cloud. And there are a lot of elaborate theories which have sprung up around her. Um, I do think George is doing something cool with her, but I don't know what it is. So I think it's going to, we're going to find out in fire and blood. But uh, if, if there's anybody that has theories about Alice rivers, they could put them out there. I just forget what it is. Basically. She's like supposed to be a red priestess or a shadow binder or what? I'm not sure. There are a few women in the history of fire and blood that seem magical um Tyena of the tower maybe uh we should go through all of those and try to figure out if there's any clues about what they're actually doing so black stone under the wall could there be black stone under the wall well the place where george got the inspiration for the ice wall of westeros is hadrian's wall pictured here which is a small stone wall this could have been how the wall started out before the others made the ice wall, if the others did that, perhaps it was a stone wall built out from the from the night fort that got covered in ice. And if Azor Ahai and the last hero and all that crap has ties to a shy in the great empire of the dawn, that means that the dragon lords were in Westeros. And that's basically the few stone fortress in Old Town. That's the purpose of the few stone fortress is to show us that dragon lords came here for the long night and built at least one thing. Right? One second. So if the Dragon Lords were there in Westeros, and if they were the ones that started the building of the wall, fused stone would be about the best thing to use. Okay. It's indestructible and it's magical. So fused stone could even be set with fire magic spells that repel the others. Then later, it could have been covered over with ice, either by a Stark wielding ice magic or by the others. Who knows? Um, but there's an obvious parallel to the wall, which is the five forts. Over in the east, the five forts are built of fused stone, and they're built by the Great Empire of the Dawn. So maybe 
that is a clue that that you know there's a few stone involved in the wall so then could be oily stone i think few stone makes more sense but oily black stone i'm more looking for that in the heart of winter but i just threw that in there as well but mainly i'm thinking about fused black stone so perhaps that is what george is planning on revealing at some point i tend to think that it's more weirwoods built into the wall that that is the important magic thing as opposed to black stone think about the wall as like a ley line like a magical ley line that they built on okay so here's here's a crazy and fun theory summer islanders are from sothorius and this is the summer isles by manuel grad it's a pretty simple theory the theory is that sothorios is like a very weird and magically overrun africa it's it's like um it's kind of like george playing with the old uh, racist European view of Africa as the dark continent, right? We know he's, we know that book, the heart of darkness is something that he's read. So it's almost like in a song of ice and fire, if you turned all those legends true, and instead of black people being strange people with different color skin, well, they have brindled men and monsters and wyverns and plagues and things like that. However, there are obviously black people in a song of ice and fire and they live on Hawaii like big Hawaii kind of um, it's that's what the summer isles are like. They're basically a tro tropical Island and they have a sort of enlightened sex positive culture, which everyone agrees is obviously the only place anyone would really ever want to live in a song of ice and fire is the summer isles. So at least they have a nice place to live, but here's the thing. People come, black people come from Africa. Everybody comes from Africa, but obviously black people live in Africa and we've got this continent right where Africa should be on the map. Because obviously a lot of A Song of Ice and Fire is loosely paralleled on Europe and Asia. So here's the thing. The Summer Islanders have very old memories of trying to form colonies on Sothorios that they were... They were driven away from. I'm not sure how, how, yeah, Madagascar is probably another comparison, perhaps. But it's a little further away. The Summer Isles are pretty far away. Um, so that's why I said Hawaii. Obviously, Hawaii is not anywhere near Africa, but either way, either way. So the point is uh, kind of Indonesia like, too. Um, so the tropical island is a point. So, but, but Sothorios being an obvious Africa parallel. And then we hear, like I said, the Summer Islanders made colonies on Sothorios, but a long time ago. And we know that the uh, Summer Islanders are the world's best mariners. So they've always had seafaring skill. So here's what I'm saying. Summer Islanders used to live on Sothorios. Just like, I mean... <laughs> They lived, they lived on the fantasy version of Africa, but the Bloodstone Emperor, or maybe the Great Empire of the Dawn, altogether, they were the ones doing all these human-animal hybrid experiments, trying to create the blood of the dragon. And this complements the Dracomorph theory. And essentially, they turned Sothorios into the island of Dr. Moreau, except for the Dr. Moreau was the Bloodstone Emperor slash the Great Empire of the Dawn. So all the brindled men and winged men, and all that stuff, those are weird magical hybrid spawn, the results of the Bloodstone Emperor's many experiments needed to create the blood of the dragon. And that is why the Summer Islanders were chased off of their home continent. So those memories of forming colonies on Sothorios that they got chased away from, like in the Dawn Age or something, that's actually that's actually gonna be their origin. So instead of them having formed colonies on Sothorios, those are memories of them coming from Sothorios and using their great mariner skill to find their new home on the Summer Islands. Maybe they already knew about the Summer Isles, but that is the theory. I thought of this. I'm surprised no one else did. It seems obvious to me, but yeah, the Summer Islanders are from Sothorios. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> 
pretty obscure, but I think the clues are all there. It's not really, a, you know, um, or it could have been a failed reclamation, Derp Master says. Yeah, exactly. Good point. So there you go. Summer Isles getting some tinfoil theory love. Next, we have the others are from space. From space. Look at them. They've got stars in their eyes. Are they watching the stars or did they come from the stars? The dragons came from the moon. Did the others ride to earth on the back of those meteors? This is a Lovecraftian idea. It's not to be taken too literally. I don't think we'll ever get the reveal on this. But with all of the Lovecraftian ideas in A Song of Ice and Fire, yes, bears. <clears throat> there's a lot in Lovecraft about alien intelligences from other worlds, and specifically they can only manifest on Earth when the stars align. That's when, you know, these unpronounceable old one deities can come to earth and control people and their their powers are great and they can give everyone dreams and people help them awaken and all sorts of very dark stuff so we know that like i said not we know but my head canon is that bloodstone emperor slash hazel high he called down he broke the moon called the comet broke the moon meteors come down he worships the black meteor and maybe makes a sword from it so obviously the meteor is magic. The dawn meteor is said to be magical. So I think meteors and comets are tend to be magical, just like the moons are. So we've got this magical black meteor. It's a piece of the fire moon. And he is the one that becomes Night's King and creates the others, right? So his dragon seed goes to Night's Queen and helps create the others. Also, like I said, there could be a meteor in the heart of winter, just like there is in the heart of shadow. So a couple different ways you have either the meteor itself or a guy that used meteor magic, having a hand in the creation of the others. So maybe the others, the intelligence of the others, maybe it is an alien intelligence that came to earth on those meteors. I don't think it's the case, but it's a fun little yarn to spin for you. So it is down here in the tin foil section of the mythical astronomy iceberg the others are from spurs <clears throat> okay next the secret ingredient in valerian steel is moon meteors oh by the way that last picture of the others this was justin madden i use this picture a lot <clears throat> um so you guys are well familiar it's a great picture these two I've selected because it shows the true black of Valerian steel. The one on the left is Aegon, The Unworthy by Mark Simonetti. And the one on the right is, uh, and that would be him knighting Damon Blackfire. And the one on the right is uh, Fagon. I wanted to give Fagon some love. So that's Fagon <clears throat> potentially uh, in Westeros in the snow, waving to his peeps with Blackfire. So this is a conjectural picture. This is a speculative image of Fagon wearing the ruby crown of Aegon the Conqueror with black fire. So he's got all the Targaryen trappings revealed. My name is Fagon. I'm really not real. And there he is, Illyrio's son. <laughs> Illyrio's son dressed up like a friggin' Aegon the Conqueror. Oh, it's such a joke. There he is. Anyways, black steel. Nobody can make Valerian steel anymore. And the secret ingredient is not blood because the cohort, the cohort Smiths have been trying blood sacrifice <clears throat> and they can rework Valerian steel, but they can't recreate it. No matter what they do, no matter how many babies they kill, they can't do it. So there's a secret. There's something about Valerian steel that's lost. Well, maybe it's a magic, maybe it's a spell, but maybe it's an ingredient. Maybe it is a magic, maybe it is a missing ingredient. And that missing ingredient could be oily black stone, AKA moon meteorite. <clears throat> because the uh, the Valerians took over. They took over the island of uh, Gorgai and renamed it Gogossos. And it's right next to the Isle of Toads, which has the black oily meteor, uh, the black oily toad idol. 
And on Golgossos is where the Valerians made it humans and animals and did dark blood magic hybrid spawn shit. So, and then there was a horrible plague there, <clears throat> which is in Crow Food's daughter's videos about the, uh, about the uh, blood of the dragon. But the Valerians were setting up camp right there next to an oily black stone idol. And they were doing blood magic there. So maybe that's where they learned how to create Valerian steel is by experimenting with that oily black stone. And all Valerian steel has oily black stone in it. So they are all meteorite swords. Um, there's lots of oily stone. So you could, it could be the case. And um, there's that whole drinking the light thing, right? The Valerian steel is of Oathkeeper and Widow's Whale is so dark it drinks the light, it drinks the sunlight. That's also the description of the oily black stone. So there's a couple of little clues by that. There's other stuff that drinks the light too, so it's not conclusive. But I do think it's possible that the secret ingredient in Valerian steel is oily black stone. They are very obviously trying to recreate Lightbringer by doing blood magic to create a magic sword. That is the Lightbringer formula from the Lightbringer myth. So... <clears throat> All the Valerian magic comes from the Great Empire of the Dawn and the Bloodstone Emperor, meaning Azor High, in my opinion, which is why most of it's fire magic, just like Relorism, which also connects to Azor High. See how all my theories kind of fit together? It's because I'm not crazy. And finally, and finally, last one of the day, Ned's Ice is the original Lightbringer. I used to believe this more than I do. But it's, it starts with a narrative thing. The most important sword in this story is ice. Okay? It's ice. It's not dawn. It's ice. Ice is the one we're attached to. It's the one we care about. It's the one that we've been watching. It's been transformed. And it is... It has been... It's in the hands now of Brienne, who's another important character. The sword ice has taken on red and black coloring. So now it looks like Lightbringer and Arya compared it to the Red Comet. So it's obviously a Lightbringer symbol. There's no question about that. <clears throat> Oathkeeper, um, the, the lions, the, the jeweled ruby eyes on Oathkeeper's pommel, when Catelyn has it in the cave, they look like two red stars. Okay, so this comp, this sword, Ice, and now Oathkeeper and Widow's Whale, it's definitely a symbol of Lightbringer and the Red Comet. <clears throat> but could it be more than a symbol? This is the tinfoil. So it, we are told that Ned's Ice is 400 years old, and it's from Valeria. It's right in the first chapter, Catelyn's in Catelyn's inner monologue. Ned's ice for the naming tradition goes back to the age of heroes, but Ned's sword is 400 years old and it's from Valyria. Okay. <clears throat> and by the way, the, the drawing on the right is actually um, Rickard Stark. And that's by Mike Hallstein. And on the left is Ned Stark by John Boccaccio, but it's the same ice. So Ned's sword is 400 years old, right? What if it's not, though? What if that's just the cover story? Catelyn obviously would not know the deep truth of House Stark. Ned might not even friggin' know. Catelyn definitely doesn't know. <clears throat> but what if when Ned's ancestor went to Dragonstone to buy, to buy ice, to buy a Stark Valerian steel sword, they showed up at Dragonstone, they talked to that this time is before the Doom, so it might have been Targaryens on Dragonstone. Anar Targaryen himself might have sold Ned Ice. The timing lines up, actually. Or it would have been whoever the, whatever Valerians were on Dragonstone before Anar showed up. One of those two. So he would have gone to Dragonstone to buy a sword. I don't think the Valerians come around like traveling merchants. They don't stoop to such. If you want a Valerian steel sword, you definitely have to go to Dragonstone, right? <clears throat> so what if on the day they go to Dragonstone to buy a sword, Anar Targaryen is eating lunch, or maybe he's on vacation, and there's a new guy at the counter. And instead of selling him a Valerian steel sword off the rack, the rack is empty. He's like, well, what about that one in the glass case? 
and I'm clearly making a guitar store analogy here. And so he accidentally sells the vintage 56 Strat instead of the 56 reissue Strat. You know what I'm saying? He accidentally sold Jimi Hendrix's guitar from the museum instead of the model of Jimi Hendrix's guitar. And so what it is for, it is from Valeria and they did buy it, but it was actually the original Azor Heise Lightbringer, which obviously the Valerians have and keep in the glass case. So <laughs> the last bit, I'm at, I made that silly at the end. Um, it doesn't obviously it doesn't have to have a new guy working at the counter. That's, that's just my fun guitar store analogy. But <clears throat> no, the idea is that Azor Ahai's Lightbringer, if it's anywhere, okay, if there was, this is the two swords theory. It means that there's two Lightbringers. There's Dawn the White Sword and Lightbringer the Black Meteor Sword. They obviously would have fought during the War for the Dawn. Whoever was leading the others would have had one sword. And whoever was the last hero would have had the other. <clears throat> so Dawn gets left down south. It's the ice sword. What if the fire sword got left at Winterfell in the north? That's really the sensible theory, is that it's been there since the Age of Heroes, since it did its original job. It's in Winterfell. It's probably put down in the crypts. And at some point, they brought it out. Like when they started selling Valerian steel swords. <clears throat> and Valerian steel was common. Now they have a cover for wielding Lightbringer. So then they pulled it out of the crypts. Like, oh yeah, this is uh, Uncle uh, uh, Edric. Uh, he bought it from uh, Dragonstone. Totally. Yeah, there's, there's, our, there's our receipt. Don't look at it too close. Um, and so actually they've uh, they've had Lightbringer down in the crypts this whole time. And they've brought it out. <clears throat> but more likely what I think is that... Uh, Oathkeeper will end up being a new light bringer. It'll end up being lit on fire. It might be wielded by John or Brienne or somebody like that <clears throat> or Jamie. Um, I would say either John or Brienne and uh, we'll see it on fire. And so we'll see, we'll see Oathkeeper become light bringer and we'll get to wonder if maybe it was the original one, but where else would it be? Here's my question guys is like, if it's not ice or it could be black fire, like maybe, Maybe Blackfire, the ancestral Targaryen sword, that could be Azor High's Lightbringer. But if it's not that, I don't know what it is. And I don't think it would just be lost. So if there was an original black sword, it should turn up somewhere. So where could it be? In Old Town, maybe? I mean, obviously it could be Dawn, but if, if there was two swords, one is Dawn, where would the other one be? It could be Ice. And there you have it. Let me take off the pictures and we'll look at the whole theory iceberg and we'll see how far we've come. So here we go, four hours. We're basically four hours on the nose here. And we've covered all these theories pretty much in depth. Like I said, there is going to be a part two, which will cover predictions for the main story. So not ancient lore, they will all be theories about what's going to happen at the end of the story or what is happening in the story. And that will be next Sunday, I would think, or maybe two Sundays. I don't know. I shouldn't. I never plan ahead very well. So I will do it soon. I'll say that much. So thank you, friends. Thank you for joining me. I hear the applause coming through. Yes, yeah. yeah. Everyone's very happy. I have very high attendance. So I know you guys liked it. And uh, yeah. So real quick, did I miss anything? Are there any ancient lore LML theories that I forgot? Jojen Paste. Well, I guess that's current. That's a current story theory. That's right. I didn't forget that. But uh, yeah. I see the applause. Yes. It's already over. Come on, Clowny. Ah, come on, man. And once again, shout out to Alt Shift X, whose Theory Iceberg model I copied. And let's see, a couple of PayPal's. Christopher Ellis. What do you think of the theory that Orly Blackstone is petrified weirwood? So that theory you can find on the Disputed Lands channel. That's a Crow Foods daughter. 
I think it makes a lot of sense, but I'm against it because I think the oily black stone is meteorite created. But I think that this is the best theory if it's not that. It's a good theory. It definitely makes sense. And the symbolism lines up well. So I don't unbelieve it. <clears throat> I would say I have competing tinfoil, a competing headcanon. But it's good. You should watch the video. It's worth watching. Definitely worth watching. And that's on the Disputed Lands channel. And that looks like all the PayPal. So let me just make sure I didn't miss any. Yes, we're good. So thank you, everyone who has clicked the join button with the memberships, joined Patreon, PayPal, sent me money in any way. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm going to go uh, eat a nice dinner and make some more tea and probably not talk a whole lot <laughs> for the rest of the day. But thank you, guys. It's been lovely. It's been a great time. This has been one of the most fun streams I've ever done. And you were here to be a part of it. So thank you. And one more time, I'll show you the, uh, we'll put all the theories up on the board. So I can get that sense of completion. Hey, psh, stop it. Cleo, stop. We're almost done. There it is. The LML theory iceberg. All right, guys, take care. I will see you soon. And go watch Fire Whites if you haven't already. Good Lord. Melisandre Secrets 3. Sick, bro. Go check it out.